A Love Untamed by Pamela Palmer Narrated by Rob Shapiro Chapter 1 Eight Days Ago Kieran twisted, avoiding the male's kick, then swung out with his own, slamming his opponent to the hardwood floor. Good try, Kieran said, holding his hand out to the male and helping him up. Again. The male groaned but nodded, shoving a sweaty lock of hair out of his eyes. The gym on the outskirts of Dublin was unair-conditioned and hot despite the late spring temperatures outside, smelling of sweat and hard work. Inside, more than forty new recruits sparred. As the two men circled, Kieran called to the larger group, Watch your opponent's hands. Always know where they are. Hands are a mage's most dangerous weapons. He didn't have to add that a mage could enthrall a Therian with a single touch, rendering him a puppet to be turned on his fellows, or to be captured or killed. The Therians had been at war with the mage for millennia, and his recruits knew it all too well. Fortunately, Therians had the advantage of muscle mass few mage possessed. Once they'd had far more advantage than that, at one time, all Therians had been shapeshifters, able to shift into their animals at will. But those days ended five millennia ago when, for a brief period of time, the mage and Therians banded together, mortgaging the bulk of their power to defeat the demons, who were terrorizing the earth. They'd succeeded. The demons had been locked in a mystical blade from which they'd never escaped, but the power the two races had mortgaged never returned. When the dust had settled, only one Therian of each of the animal lines had retained the power of his or her animal and the ability to shift. Those few had banded together, the strongest and finest of the race, and become known as the Feral Warriors. The rest of the Therians, Kirin included, shifted only in their dreams, fighting their enemies the human way, with their fists and knives. His opponent leaped at him, too high, and Kirin easily flipped him over his shoulder. Keep your center of gravity low, boyo. Try it again. The male looked thirty but could be anywhere from twenty-five to a thousand or more, as all immortals ceased to age once they were fully grown. The man hunched over for a moment, catching his breath. Any word on the new fox? The fox feral warrior had died last month in a mage attack of some sort. The feral warriors tended to be a tight-knit and tight-lipped bunch, and the details had never been leaked to the greater Therian community. But the death itself had not been kept a secret. When one feral died, the animal spirit flew to the next in the line, the strongest Therian with that animal's shifter DNA, marking him to take the dead shifter's place. The marking could take weeks, even months, but ultimately, another would be marked, and the entire Therian world was abuzz with excitement, each of them wondering if he or she might be the one. Kieran shook his head. No word. A flicker of hope danced in his chest because the truth was it could be him. Unlike most Therians, he knew he possessed fox shifter DNA. After five millennia, most Therians no longer knew their ancestral makeup, but Kieran's father was old, born only a few hundred years after the sacrifice, and his father's mother had been born a fox shifter. Both had been talented intuitives, often knowing things before they happened. Kieran had inherited that ability to a lesser degree, to a fairly useless degree, unfortunately. His own gut offered him truths that were generally so vague as to be worse than nothing. He could be the one marked this time if the animal spirit deemed him the strongest and finest of those who possessed the fox shifter DNA. The thought filled him with both a wild excitement and mixed emotions. Being chosen would be a tremendous honor, and being able to shapeshift as his ancestors had. Incredible. But being chosen to become a feral warrior was a life's commitment. There was no turning it down and no going back. All feral warriors lived together with the Radiant, the one woman marked by the goddess to pull the energies from the earth that empowered the ferals. The new fox would have to move to Great Falls, Virginia, and live at Feral House with the other shifters. 
he would become part of a greater whole, one of the warriors on the front lines of the battle to protect the world from the threat of the demon's return. Karen looked up at the wooden rafters above, his mind across the Atlantic. All things considered, would he choose to be the new fox shifter if the choice were his? With a low chuckle, he nodded to himself. Hell yes. Switch partners, he called, and three female recruits rushed him at once, all with that look in their eyes that told him they'd be happy to partner with him in any way he wished. With a grin that encompassed all three, he motioned one to approach him and the other two to face one another. All three laughed. The one he'd chosen to work with gave him a beaming smile that quickly turned to surprise as he swept her feet out from under her. She slammed onto her back on the wood floor with a sharp cry of pain. He refused to train his recruits on mats. Therians were immortal and indestructible. They might break something in the fall, but they'd heal within a minute. It was better if they learned to deal with the pain right from the start. If they weren't suited to the Therian guard, he wanted to know it now. Keep your mind on the fight, pet, he told the woman, helping her up. She threw him a look that was part wary smile, part feminine speculation. You've got good moves, Kieran. He laughed. I, I do. But the only moves I'm showing you here, pet, are the ones that might keep you alive if the demons return. Come now, he said, crouching low and beginning to circle her. Let's see what you can do. Fifteen minutes later, he took a break, letting one of his subordinates lead the training as he grabbed his towel and wiped the sweat from his brow and the back of his neck. Jill, one of his lieutenants, joined him, her long legs encased in black fighting pants, her smile as warm and inviting as an Irish pub on a cold winter's night, as she handed him a cup of water. I've never seen so many female Therians wanting to learn to fight, she murmured. Most of them have no business here. Kieran shrugged. They want to learn how to defend themselves. Jill snorted. What they want is a chance at your bed. You're a legend, you know. Aye, he did, though he was well used to it. He glanced around the room and found nearly two-thirds of the class paying more attention to his movements than to their opponents. No coincidence, two-thirds of the class was female. He'd been blessed or cursed. He often couldn't decide which with the ability to draw females like bees to honey whether he wanted to or not. They watched him with eyes full of invitation, the bolder ones offering themselves freely. When the call went out to the Therian enclaves to get their people in fighting shape, every female on the British Isles chose our group to train with. I wonder why, Jill added dryly. Kieran took a long swig of the cool water and smiled. You jealous, pet? Her expression turned serious. I could be, Kieran, if I thought I could ever truly win your heart. Inside, he squirmed. This was the discussion he loathed, for he truly hated the thought of hurting her, of hurting any of them. I have no heart to give you, Jill, he said quietly, regretfully. So you've told me many a time, but you're wrong, Kieran. You have a big heart in that finely hewn chest. You just haven't met the right female yet. And as much as I wish otherwise, I'm not the one. No, she wasn't. No woman was, as he tried to tell them all. He'd watched one woman whom he'd loved more than his own life die. It didn't matter that she'd been his sister, not his lover. Over the centuries, he'd watched good friends take mates in a ritual that bound one to the other body and soul— and watched as one died and the one left behind suffered untold agony, unable to fully live again. Mating bonds between the immortals was far more than a simple promise to love and cherish. They could not be severed. No, he would never take a mate. If losing his sister could hurt so much, how much more would losing a wife? He'd long ago decided that love of any kind led to heartache and nothing more. He was better off without it. He hooked his arm around Jill's neck and placed a kiss on her cheek. You're a fine thing, pet, and I love you in my way. You know that. I, I know it, Kieran. I know it. Releasing Jill, he turned his attention back to the class, ignoring the females, 
too many of whom were still paying him more mind than they were their opponents. Two of the males caught his attention, one of the smaller men whom Kieran had already pegged as a future leader, and a beefy Welshman with a look in his eye that Kieran didn't like. A hard gleam Kieran suspected revealed a mean streak. Either the attitude or the male were going to have to go. As Kieran watched, the Welshman's opponent, quick and tough, managed to throw the bigger man. A flash caught Kieran's eye, light reflecting on metal as the Welshman, still on his arse, swung out. A knife, damn it! The blade sliced through the smaller man's thigh in a spray of blood. Feck! Kieran reached him in a dozen angry strides, slammed his fist through the wanker's face as he ripped the knife from his hand, then threw the blade hard, burying it deep in one of the wood ceiling beams. What did I tell you on the first day of training? he shouted. No knives! No knives! The Welshman leaped to his feet, fury in his eyes. And suddenly those eyes began to change to animal eyes, as only a true shifter's ever would. Bloody hell. As Kieran stared, fangs dropped from the black guard's mouth, and the wanker began to laugh. Though he'd yet to shift, and wouldn't until he'd been brought into his animal during a ritual performed by the rest of the feral warriors, it was clear the fox shifter had been chosen. Even the newly marked could pull fangs and claws— what the shifters called going feral. He stared at the wanker. The finest in the fox shifter line? Well, bloody fecking hell. The new feral warrior swung, for once catching Kieran off guard. Too late, Kieran realized that the hand coming for him was now filled with sharp claws. He felt those claws rip down his face, from temple to jaw, removing skin and muscle showering him in his own warm blood. Pain burned through his face as he healed. Fury roared through his mind at the fact that this asshole had been chosen to defend the race. Over him! With a growl, Kieran threw a punch, intending to show the bastard he could still take him, but his hand didn't, wouldn't, close, and he wound up scratching the Welshman instead. No, not scratching. Clawing. He stared at the flesh now hanging from the man's shocked face, and at the bloody claws where a moment ago his own fingernails had been. What the feck? Had he turned into a bloody monster? His tongue snagged on the teeth suddenly crowding his mouth. No, not teeth, fangs. Like the Welshman, he'd gone feral. But two new feral warriors? Impossible. Unless another had died without them knowing. Dismay, shock, and elation all warred within him, all trying to find purchase. People crowded around them, gaping, silent. It wasn't every day Ethereum got to see a feral warrior. Kieran himself had never laid eyes on one, not in the entirety of his over three hundred years. Now, apparently, he was one. The others all started talking at once. I thought only the fox had died. Maybe the ferals were attacked again, and we didn't know. You have to call Feral House. Karen met the Welshman's gaze, glad to see the male's eyes were once more human, his fangs and claws retracted. Karen's own slid away as well. Jill joined him her eyes wide and her face, drenched in dismay. You're leaving, then, to join the ferals? I... The thought sent a thrill through his body. It's a dangerous business, she said, her voice uneven. They're on the front line of the battle. Two are dead. But the front line was exactly where he wanted to be, fighting back evil, making a difference, he met the Welshman's gaze and saw again that look in his eyes that he didn't like. Maybe the male was one of those who didn't take well to authority in any form. Or maybe he was just an asshole. Either way, apparently, they were now brothers. For the rest of their immortal lives. As he pulled out his phone to call his enclave and get the number for Feral House, 
Goosebumps rose on his arms, a telltale sign that his intuition was kicking in with some tidbit of knowledge that would likely be of little use. Wrong. Wrong. And what in the hell did that mean? That he was wrong in thinking his gift would be of little use? Wrong in trying to call Feral House right now? The time in Washington, D.C. was about 7.30 a.m. Too early? Or was his gut trying to tell him something more profound? Who knew? There was no use worrying about it. What was done was done. He'd been marked to join the exclusive ranks of the Feral Warriors, and there was no turning it down. Nor did he want to. All his life he'd dreamed that this moment might someday be his, and he was damn well going to celebrate it, even if his gut continued to whisper that one word over and over. Wrong. Three days ago, just before dawn on a cloudless night, Karen strode through the woods that hung high above the rocky falls of the Potomac River in Great Falls, Virginia, surrounded by feral warriors, both old and new. He'd thought that the fact that he and the Welshman had both been marked meant two of the feral warriors had died. But that wasn't the case, thank the goddess. For millennia there had been twenty-six feral warriors, twenty-six animal shapeshifters left in the world, each of whom shifted into a different, unique animal. Then, six centuries ago, seventeen of them fell into a spirit trap, never to return. The spirit trap had separated the men from their animal spirits, killing the men and holding the animal spirits so they could never mark another. For six hundred years, the feral warriors had numbered only nine. Then, a week ago, the first of the seventeen lost animal spirits had returned. Word hadn't reached Dublin, but the ferals had believed their new fox shifter had arrived. Instead, the new feral had shifted into a saber-toothed cat, one of the seventeen lost animals. As the ferals rejoiced, eight more had been marked and made their way to Feral House, including Karen and the Welshman. Tonight was the Renaissance, the ritual that would bring them into their animals for the first time, revealing which animal had chosen each. Karen strode down to the cliffs beside Jag, one of the original ferals, and Ewan, another of the newly marked, one he'd fought beside on both sides of the Atlantic, on and off for decades. A good man, thank the goddess. If they'd all been like the Welshmen, Kieran might have begun to wonder if the animal spirits truly marked the best in the line, as had always been claimed. The new ferals were, by and large, an unruly lot, but the originals showed every sign of living up to the legend. From what Kieran had seen, they were a good, honorable bunch, and a true brotherhood. How does this work? Kieran asked Jag, as the band of more than a dozen immortal males strode, shirtless and barefoot, along the rocks. Lion, chief of the ferals, brought up the rear with his mate Kara, their radiant. We'll call a mystic circle upon the goddess stone in order to hide what goes on from any humans who happen by. Then it's ritual time, pretty boy, Jag grinned. I don't want to spoil the surprise. A hard thrill coursed through Kieran. He was about to shift into an animal for the very first time. How many times had he done so in his dreams? How many times had he wondered what it must have been like in those ancient days when all Therians shifted? Too many to count. As he climbed down the rocks, he wondered which of the animal spirits had marked him. He hoped the fox, for that was the ancestry he knew. His mother had possessed no knowledge of her own Therian heritage. Few Therians ever made it, and virtually none were monogamous unless they did. His mother had never known who her father was, let alone his deep animal DNA, which meant Kieran could potentially have been marked by any of the seventeen animal spirits as well as the fox. He'd find out soon enough. As the original ferals gathered around Kara, Lion turned to the newcomers. Stay back until we come for you. If you touch Kara when she's radiant, without an armband, she'll kill you. You should see her when she glows, Ewan said quietly, leaning close. It's a sight you won't forget. 
Kieran grinned. It's a side we'll become well used to. Ewan chuckled, his excitement matching Kieran's own. That we will. As Kieran watched, Kara lifted her arms and literally began to glow as if she'd swallowed a small piece of the sun. She was such a sweet thing, pretty and quite young, not even a true thirty yet. She wore a slinky ritual gown and flip-flops, her hair in a ponytail, and he liked her immensely. Lion watched his mate with the devotion of a truly besotted mate, at once fiercely protective and tenderly in love. Ritual words were spoken, blood was let, and suddenly Kieran felt a blast of energy power through his body in a euphoric rush. Lights sparkled all around him, and he found himself standing at knee level, on all fours, his snout protruding from his face. Excitement burst within him, then joy, as he turned his head, eyeing his red fur, bushy tail, and very fox-like body. He was now surrounded by a polar bear where Ewan had stood, a crocodile in place of the Welshman, a grizzly, snow leopard, white tiger, lynx, and even an eagle. Shift back, Cougar told them. Kieran imagined himself once more standing on two feet, and in another shower of sparkling lights, in another euphoric rush, he found himself a man once more. Henceforth, you will be known as... Cougar's straight arm came down, pointing from one new feral to the next, starting with him. Fox. Grizz. Polaris. Leopard. Wit. Eagle. Lynx. Croc. Ewan slapped him on the back. What do you say, Fox? He laughed heartily. The ladies will love that. Kieran, no, he was Fox now, grinned and slapped the polar bear shifter on the back in return. I'd say it's a fine night, Polaris. A fine night indeed. As Ewan turned to congratulate the others, Jag approached, slapping forearms with Kieran in the traditional feral greeting. Welcome to the pack, fox man. Kara! At Lion's alarmed tone, Kieran and Jag whirled, watching as Lion swept a fainting Kara into his arms. None of the other new ferals seemed to notice, but the originals and fox all gathered close. What's the matter with her? Fox asked. Kara, rousing, curled her arm around Lion's neck. I'm okay. It's just... the rituals. It's like they're sucking me dry. Nine collective breaths released at once. Lion tipped his head against the radiance. You scared me. Smiling softly, Kara pressed her hand to her mate's cheek. I love you, my heart. Karen Fox watched them, wondering at the courage and foolishness. It took to care so much, to love so deeply, a mistake he refused to ever make himself. Chapter Two Two Days Ago Fox strode through Feral House, his boots clicking on the hardwood floor, the golden fox had armband that had appeared during his first shift tied around his upper arm, his mind in turmoil. For days his gut had continued to whisper that same fecking word. Wrong. And now he thought he knew why. Hell, everything was wrong. The situation at Feral House could not be worse. Last night the new ferals, those who'd been marked by the lost animal spirits, had risen up against the rest of them, attempting to slaughter them. Jag and Panther had been badly injured, badly enough that they all had feared for their lives, but they were pulling through. One of the new ferals, Eagle, was dead, and the rest were gone. Even Ewan, Polaris. It was all too clear that the evil mage were behind this. Somehow the mage had freed the trapped animal spirits and infected them, with some kind of dark magic that had not only kept them from marking the best of the line, but had somehow managed to control the resulting ferals, turning them into their own evil feral army. The good feral warriors were in a hell of a mess. Thank the goddess he'd been marked by the fox and not one of the seventeen lost spirits. 
As he strode down the hallway, he saw Cougar coming out of the media room. Any news? Fox asked. Cougar was a cold-eyed warrior with a mustache and goatee that made him look more than a little unapproachable, but he'd welcomed Fox warmly and given him no reason to think he wouldn't share whatever he knew. Jag and Panther will be returning soon, and we may be able to cure the new ferals of that dark infection. That's brilliant. Then the mage plot will have failed. Cougar plucked at his goatee. Not entirely. Not all those marked were the best of their line. Perhaps none of them were. While Fox had the highest respect for you and it hated that his friend had been caught up in this mess, he could only feel relief that the asshole Welshman wasn't actually meant to be marked. His faith in the feral warriors as a whole, and his pride in being one of them, had been restored. The shaman believes that my mate, Ariana, may have the solution buried inside the wealth of knowledge in her head. Cougar continued. That's a bloody intriguing comment. Cougar looked at him. Are you aware that she's Alina? The queen of the Alinas. Fox nodded. I heard. Which is another bloody intriguing comment. For a thousand years the world thought the Alinas extinct? He cocked his head at the far more senior feral. You knew the truth? No. I only learned the truth recently. Where have they been all this time? Most of them in the Crystal Realm, their castle in the clouds. Fox knew he meant that literally. Ariana will be arriving momentarily. Even as Cougar said the words, Fox smelled a whiff of pine, then watched, awestruck, as two petite beauties materialized out of thin air. Alina's. The one was a pretty brunette dressed in jeans and boots and leather jacket. The way she looked at Cougar, with a lover's smile, told him she must be Ariana. But it was the other one who caught Fox's attention and clamped her pretty little fist tight around it. Her hair as light as her companion's was dark. She was dressed in a timeless outfit that marked her a warrior. Leggings and tunic that skimmed graceful curves a knife hanging from the belt at her slender waist, golden hair falling in a thick braid down her back. She appeared as delicate as a doll, her head small and lovely, her nose pert, her mouth a pretty, petal pink. But when she glanced his way, sapphire eyes pinned him, eyes as hard as blue diamonds, and suddenly she didn't seem delicate at all. As their gazes held, his heart went still, then began beating like a herd of spooked cattle. Fire leaped into her eyes, but not the kind of fire he was used to. There was no warmth in those sapphire eyes, no desire. Only a bright, cutting heat that promised to flay the flesh from his bones. The beauty jerked her gaze from his, turning toward Cougar and his mate. Hawk and Faith joined Fox. He hadn't even seen them enter the hallway. Amazing that they still exist, isn't it? Fox murmured to the pair, unable to tear his gaze away from the Alina. She was like a little spitfire, eyes snapping with anger, that pretty mouth twisted with annoyance. Still, she's a fine thing, the blonde. That's Melisande, Hawk said quietly beside him. Melisande, a lovely name for an intriguing woman. Apparently, she tried to kill Lion a couple of weeks ago, Hawk continued. Fox glanced at him with surprise. And he let her live? His gaze returned to the female with a new appreciation, so she knew how to use that sword. No, not delicate at all. That was my reaction first time I heard. It was something of a misunderstanding, and they've called a truce of sorts— but the woman apparently has a chip on her shoulder the size of the South Pole when it comes to ferals. That one's trouble with a capital T. Sapphire eyes cut to him, then away again, without an ounce of interest, without a modicum of warmth. Chips can be knocked off. Faith snorted beside him. So can heads. Fox chuckled. She hasn't met the right feral yet, is all. Hawk clasped him on the shoulder. You'd have more luck taming a tornado. Cougar turned to them. 
Fox, Faith, I'd like you to meet Ariana, Queen of the Alinas, and my mate, and her second, Melisande. The blonde scowled, and he wondered if she was really as cold as she pretended to be. If he'd seen only her, he might wonder if that were typical of her race, but Ariana's eyes radiated warmth and love along with strength. Melisande interested him mightily. His gaze dropped to her mouth, a paradox if ever there was one. At once hard enough to flay a man alive and yet shaped like a lover's dream, the bottom lip plump and kissable, the top sculpted in pale pink perfection. Ariana strode forward and introductions were made. Then she turned back toward Cougar. Where's the shaman? I understand we have work to do. As Ariana started back to the doorway where Melisanda and Cougar waited, Fox followed, eyeing Melisanda, turning on the charm. Could such a cold woman be charmed? The thought made him smile. It had been too long since any female had presented a challenge. With each step he took, the woman grew more beautiful. Her skin was a flawless cream, as soft, he was certain, as her eyes were hard. Her lashes, a darker gold than her hair, perfectly framed those magnificent eyes. Her body, though small, was perfectly proportioned, her curves neither too slender nor too round, and his hands itched to clutch her waist and pull her against him. As he drew close, her scent of wild heather teased his nose, nearly drowning him in pleasure. Melisande, is it? he asked, drawing on the full force of his Irish upbringing. A beautiful name for a beautiful woman. Sapphire eyes snapped at him with disbelief, certainly not the usual reaction to his attention, but he played the game the way he knew how. He held out his hand to her, uncertain whether she would meet him halfway, and suspecting that if she did, it would be with a huff or a roll of pretty blue eyes. Either would be fine as long as he got to touch her. I'm Fox, Melisande. It's a pleasure to meet you. That's what you think. Her voice was music laced with acid. She ignored his outstretched hand, her eyes narrowing as she smiled at him. But there was nothing pleasant about that smile. Hawk's words came back to him, that he'd have more luck taming a tornado, and it occurred to him that he might finally have come across a female who was immune to his charms. Mel? Ariana warned. The petite blonde flung her empty hand toward him as if it were not empty at all, as if she meant to toss a fireball in his face. Instead, exquisite sexual pleasure rushed through his body on a blast so strong, so pure, that he nearly came right there in the middle of the hallway. On a groan, he arched his back, his eyes dropping closed as the pleasure roared through him, wave after wave of pure ecstasy. When he could move again, his eyes snapped open, and he straightened to find the most fascinating woman he'd ever met staring at him in wide-eyed disbelief, her mouth forming a horrified O. Oh, a grin spread slowly across his face, his gaze locking with hers. The next time he felt that kind of rapture in her presence, he'd be deep inside of her, and she'd be screaming her release right along with him. Go to hell, shimmered in Melisande's eyes, as if she'd heard his silent promise, her mouth snapping closed, once more tightening into a hard line. With a low growl of fury, the beauty disappeared, misting away. Fox began to laugh. What did you do to her? Cougar asked, clearly puzzled. Fox shook his head. I've no bloody idea. Watch your step, Ariana warned softly. Melisande is a good person, but she has a violent and justified hatred of Therians. While she's obligated to honor my alliance with the Ferals, she's unpredictable. She won't try to kill you, but that's about all I can guarantee, and if you hurt her, even that's off the table. Point taken. But the grin hovered at the edges of his mouth, the pleasure still coursing through his body. He had no intention of hurting her, not at all. 
what he had in mind would have her arching with as much pleasure as she'd just given him, and more. Far more. As Ariana left to speak to the shaman, Lion and Kara strode down the hallway toward them. Lion caressed his mate's hair. Are you up to it? Of course, Kara smiled, gazing up at her mate with adoration. In the short time he'd been at Feral House, Fox had come to realize that the love between the Feral's chief and their radiant was the beating heart of the house, and the bedrock that held them all together regardless of what crisis they found themselves in and they'd faced one crisis after another since his arrival. Kara turned front again, catching Fox watching them. She smiled at him sweetly, a woman impossible not to adore. In her jeans and bare feet she exuded a girl-next-door wholesomeness at odds with her role as the most powerful of the non-shifting Therians. In some ways she was more powerful even than the shifters, for without her, within a couple of months— they'd begin to lose the power of their animals. Radiance, Lion said, squeezing his mate's shoulder gently. Though it wasn't necessary to take a shot of Radiance directly from the source, Kara empowered them through proximity. None of them ever turned down an invitation for that pure energy rush. As Kara held her hands out at her sides, Cougar stepped forward and curled his fingers around one slender wrist, a smile for her in his eyes. Hawk tugged on her ponytail like a fond older brother, then wrapped his hand around her other wrist. As Lion slid his hand beneath Kara's ponytail, pressing his palm against the back of her neck in a gesture at once possessive and tender, Fox stepped forward to kneel at her feet, slipping his hand around one bare ankle. Little radiant, Lion said softly, and a moment later, Kara lit up her skin glowing brightly enough to light a darkened room. Going radiant, they called it. Warm, lush energy rushed through Fox's body. The Earth's energy, the lifeblood of a feral warrior, channeled through the golden armband that had appeared during his first shift. But it was the rush of a different energy, one of pure rapture, that he couldn't get out of his mind nor could he think of anything but the sapphire-eyed beauty who delivered it, and how he was going to coax her into his bed. Melisande stormed down the grand corridor of the Alina's palace in the crystal realm, grabbing an ancient vase off its pedestal and smashing it on the emerald floor, with a roar of fury that set the chandeliers to swaying, the torches on the crystal walls to flickering, and the few Alina sisters who'd been keeping a wary eye on her fleeing in mist. Damn it! Even now, far from Feral House, that shifter's face swam in her mind. Fox. She'd noticed him the moment she'd missed it into Feral House at Ariana's side, though what female with eyes in her head wouldn't have. The male was appallingly good-looking, a Greek god with golden waves of hair falling to broad shoulders framing a face of true perfection, high cheekbones, a straight patrician nose, a strong chiseled jaw and eyes the blue of a summer sky. Dressed in black military pants and an army green tee, he'd looked like the warrior he undoubtedly was, and oh, that t-shirt had fit him well, pulling snugly across his chest and arms, setting off his muscular form to true perfection. Around one thick biceps had curled the golden feral armband with the head of a fox. She'd found herself staring at him, unable to look away. That she'd noticed him annoyed her. That he'd caught her staring at him infuriated her. But the worst, the very worst, was that when their gazes met, she'd felt awareness. Awareness! For the first time in forever. Her cheeks had heated, her breath had scattered, her pulse had raced and had yet to calm. The remnants of a Ming vase crunched under her heels as she paced, fury vibrating through every pore of her body, making her hands clench and unclench at her sides. The damned feral had noticed her reaction to him and acted upon it, flirting with her like she was a normal, sex-starved Alina. She'd meant to show him exactly what she thought of him, he should have felt pain. Pain. Instead, he'd felt pleasure, 
arching as if he were in the throes of orgasm. The breath caught in her lungs, and she sank back against the nearest wall, one hand curved protectively around her stomach, the other palming her forehead. She was still there moments later, her mind reeling, when her queen and friend materialized at her side. Ariana touched her shoulder. What happened down there, Mel? she asked worriedly. Melisande glared at her. I'm going to kill him. At Ariana's raised eyebrow, Melisande rolled her eyes. I'm not going to kill him, but I want to. You have no idea how much I want to. Ariana studied her. He's the one, isn't he? The one you can't intentionally harm. The one suited to be your mate. Melisande started to laugh, then choked instead, pushing away from the wall. Never! I want no male, especially not a shifter. She'd hated the shifters for so long, both the feral warriors who were able to access the power of their animals and the non-shifting Therians. They were all shifters to her, all equally vile. Well, maybe not vile, not all of them. As much as she hated to admit it, the current batch of ferals appeared to be honorable enough. The nine originals, at least. Ariana certainly thought so. And she couldn't deny they were fighting to keep Satanin and his demon horde from rising again, which any creature of the world appreciated. But that didn't alter the fact that her history with shifters was a bad one. She'd spent most of her life hating them. Now her traitorous body wanted one of them. She dug her fingers into her scalp and met Ariana's sympathetic gaze. I don't want to feel this way. Ariana's eyes widened. You want him? No. Yes. Heaven help her. For centuries, thanks to a traitorous shifter and his horrid clan, she'd been unable to bear a man's touch. The thought of it still filled her with dread. But her body had somehow awakened again despite that, and it wanted. She shook her head, eyeing her friend helplessly. When I blasted Fox... The pleasure he felt, I felt it too. N not like he had, not orgasmic, but even now, tendrils of heat swam through her blood, dampening her in secret places. I don't want this, she shouted at the top of her lungs, gripping her head because even as her body ached, her mind reeled with horror at the thought of lying with a man again. Memories she'd locked down for so long were beginning to stir. Memories of soul-destroying betrayal and of soul-stealing pain. Why now, she cried. Why a shifter? Why him? Mel. I'm sorry. None of this would have happened if Ariana hadn't found Cougar again, if she hadn't married him forcing the Alinas and the feral warriors into this unholy alliance, and the thought hung thickly in the air between them, unspoken. Is there anything I can do? Ariana asked quietly. Melisanda met her friend's gaze. Leave Cougar and forbid us from ever going near the ferals again. A glint of dark humor gleamed in Ariana's eyes. Other than that, Ariana stepped closer, her eyes soft and serious. Mel, if you need to step down from your post for a while, I completely understand. No. The word shot from Elisanda's mouth before her brain fully processed the ramifications of Ariana's offer. Think about it, Ariana said kindly, then missed it away leaving Melisanda standing among the wreckage of the shattered vase and the remnants of her own hard-won equilibrium. With a groan, she leaned back against the nearest wall, closing her eyes, forcing herself to consider her options. Because stepping down from her post as Ariana's second-in-command would mean no longer having to go anywhere near Feral House or the far too disturbing Fox. But there was no real choice, she knew that. She was by far the strongest of Ariana's warriors, by far the best able to protect her queen and her race— Ironically, the only one she trusted as much was Cougar. He would give up his life for his mate, and had nearly done so not long ago. But with the mage determined to free the demons back into the world, none of them could be too careful. 
Melisande sighed. She had no choice, not really. Dodging Feralhouse and Fox meant dodging her responsibilities, and that was something she would never do. Perhaps if she ignored the too handsome shifter, he'd go away. She snorted. After she'd nearly driven him to sexual release with a flick of her hand, not likely. He knew she hadn't meant for that to happen. Worse, he knew she'd been affected as well. The knowledge had gleamed plain as day in the predatory look in his eyes. No, he wasn't likely to lose interest any time soon. The male was bent on seduction, and her defenses were badly shaken. One day ago, Kara sat on the floor of Sky and Panther's bedroom, playing with Sky's pets, smiling at the antics of the black miniature schnauzer, Lady, and the tabby kitten, Tramp, as they simultaneously attacked a vicious chew toy. She was glad for the distraction. Skye stood at the window, worry drifting off her in waves, a worry Kara shared, though not to the same razor-sharp degree. Skye's mate, Panther, was in Poland, having led the team sent to battle the evil ferals and to stop the ritual they'd begun that appeared designed to empower the high demon Satanin. Lion remained at Feral House with a handful of men and all the ferals' mates. Feral House had to be protected, but those left behind paced and worried. Sky gasped. Kara! What's the matter? Dear God, if Sky had felt her mating bond break. Come here, quick. Kara jumped up and ran to join Sky at the window. Peering out, she saw movement beyond the trees. Vehicles. Men leaping out in dark clothing. Police! Kara gasped. A SWAT team by the looks of it. Oh, this can't be good. She raced for the door, flung it open, and ran. Lion! Her mate was halfway up the first flight of stairs before she reached the top step. He was so beautiful, her lion. So powerful and regal and sweet. Cops! A SWAT team. I think they're coming here. Foyer! Now! He shouted. The ferals all possessed far stronger hearing than humans, or even the non-shifting Therians. But if his nearby warriors didn't respond right away, he could contact them in an instant by shifting into his lion and calling to them telepathically. Lion held out his hand for her as she raced down the stairs to join him, but when she reached him, he pulled her close, kissed her hair, then said, Stay here. As he strode into the living room to peer out the front window, Skye joined her. Not ten seconds later, Ty, Jag, and Jag's mate Olivia came running. Lynx appeared at the top of the stairs and started down at a more sedate pace. One of the two new ferals who had been cleared of the dark magic, Lynx was now a full-fledged member of the feral team, even if Lion had admitted to her in private that the man was too soft to have ever been the one meant to be marked. We have trouble, Lion told them, striding from the living room. There's a human SWAT team surrounding the house. In an instant... In a spray of colored lights, Ty shifted into a fifteen-foot Bengal tiger, undoubtedly to speak to his pregnant mate, Delaney, who was napping upstairs. Ex-FBI, she was believed dead by her human colleagues. It wouldn't do for them to find her alive and well, and immortal. Nor could they find Xavier, their cook's assistant for whom the humans had been searching for weeks, or their cook, Pink, who could never pass for human. Lion's thoughts were clearly running parallel to Kara's own. His gaze caressed her with that uber-protectiveness that both warmed her and sometimes drove her nuts. Get the wives, Pink and Xavier, to the deep basement, my heart. His gaze swung to Olivia. You'll accompany me outside. Pretend to be my wife. If the situation gets out of hand, weaken them. Olivia was not only a warrior who'd fought with Ethereum Guard for centuries— but she possessed the rare ability of being able to suck the life force from others. And she had the control to drain just enough of an opponent's energy to weaken and not kill. I'll attempt to cloud the mind of the leader. Lion's gaze swung to his three warriors, even as he began plucking knives from his boots and shoving them in the drawer of the hall table. If they frisked him, he clearly didn't want them finding his weapons. If they get inside, knock them out and cloud their minds. No deaths. The last thing they needed was to become a target for the humans. 
Kara might not be a warrior, but she could certainly understand the ramifications of the humans believing that the ferals posed a danger. They'd have to leave Feral House, perhaps battle their way out, likely revealing their immortality. A disaster in every possible way. Delaney came running down the stairs, a gun strapped to her still slender waist. Less than two months pregnant, she had yet to start showing. I'll get Xavier in pink, Delaney said. Skye hurried after her, then glanced back to Kara. Kara nodded. I'll join you in a minute. Her heart was pounding at the thought of lions walking outside where all those humans would be training guns on him. While the immortals didn't age and healed most wounds almost instantly, none of them were truly immortal. They could die. And the thought of losing Lion terrified her. She glanced at Jag, saw the hard granite of his jaw, and knew he was just as worried about Olivia. But he was a warrior first, and what was more, so was Olivia, and he knew it. Olivia was the best woman for this job, and Jag would keep his mouth shut even if it killed him. By the clench of his fists, Kara suspected it just might. Police! Come out with your hands up! Lion eyed Olivia and took a deep breath. Are you ready, wife? he said, reminding her of her role. The redhead gave him a decisive nod. Ready, husband. Lynx, cover the back of the house, Ty called. Everyone else, out of the foyer. If the cops saw several more large males, it would make it impossible for Lion to convince them Feral House was merely an innocuous, if huge, family home. Kara slipped into the hallway that led to both the back of the house and the basement, Lynx following. As he brushed past her, she paused. She knew she should go downstairs. That's what Lion wanted her to do. But she couldn't make her feet move. Not when Lion could die out there. Through the now open front door, she heard him. What's the problem, officer? Lion asked. Get on the ground, face down. There's no need for that. Lion replied calmly. Kara wished she could see what was happening. Was he clouding their minds? Pushing suggestions into them? He was trying, she knew that much. We have a report of gunshots and screaming coming from this house, another cop said. Kara clenched her teeth against the lie. The house was fully warded against sound. Not even standing on the front doorstep would anyone hear the roar of the animals inside. The report was bogus, and had probably come from the mage just to cause them trouble. Kara. Link startled her, squeezing her shoulder. They're going to overrun this place. You've got to hide. She looked at the new shifter, meeting his nervous gaze. She agreed with Lyon's assessment that Link's was not the one meant to be marked. He had the mean of a teacher or an accountant, not a warrior. If the humans got inside, it would be up to Jag and Ty to contain them. She seriously doubted Lynx would be of much help. Okay. Pressing her fist against her tense stomach, she turned and strode to the basement door, slipping inside, surprised when Lynx followed her down instead of closing it behind her. I'm just going to check on the others, he said. Which would leave the back door unprotected. Coward or not, was the man stupid? Lynx... But as she turned to urge him to cover his post, he gripped her shoulder, too tight. A hard look leaped into his eyes, alarming her. I'm sorry, Kara. Before she could open her mouth to call for help, he jammed his thumb behind her ear. Her world went dark. Lion kept his arms in the air, his gaze locked with the humans in front of him. There's nothing wrong here, officer. We had the television on and the windows open. I told you it was too loud, Olivia added tartly. She turned to the officer. He insists on being able to hear the TV anywhere in the house. Lyon's gaze moved to another of the officers, then another still, catching their gazes, trying to calm them, to steal their wariness. If he could touch them, it would be far easier. But that wasn't a possibility at the moment. He had to get them out of here without incident, because there were too damn many cop cars. In the distance, gathering along the street, he could see neighbors watching the goings-on with avid eyes. If Feral House were overrun, the cops disappearing inside, 
he feared there would be no end to this. There were only so many defensive positions the ferals could take before they were forced to reveal themselves. And that was the one thing they could never do. Once the humans realized shapeshifters and magic wielders lived among them, the immortals would be forever on the run, hunted to extinction. This is all a misunderstanding, Lyon said quietly to the man in front of him, his gaze once more locked on his. There's nothing the matter here. What's he saying? One of the others asked a companion on the other side of the driveway. They might be speaking far too quietly for a human to overhear at this distance, but not a feral. Why the hell doesn't Jim have him on the ground? Beats me. He's one big motherfucker, isn't he? The cop yawned. Damn, I'm tired. And I finally got a good night's sleep last night. The man in front of him yawned as well. Lyon refrained from glancing at Olivia, but he was certain now that she'd begun draining them. Finally, the tension broke. The officer lowered his gun with a nod. This was clearly a misunderstanding. I apologize. Lyon lowered his hand slowly in as non-threatening a manner as possible. Apology accepted, officer. Lyon held out his hand to Olivia, and together they turned and made their way back to the house. He wouldn't breathe easily until the humans piled into their cars and left. The ferals would have to watch that they didn't return. It had to have been the mage, Olivia said quietly beside him, as they climbed the brick steps to the front door. But why? That's what we have to find out. Closing the front door behind them, Lyon met Ty's and Jag's gazes, then the three took up posts at the various windows, watching until the cops retreated. Where's Lynx? Lyon asked, keeping an eye out back. Good. Finally, the cops were gone. Ty pushed away from the window. I'll get Delaney and the others. Three minutes later, he returned. Roar, where's Kara? Lyon turned from the window with a jerk a vice clamping around his heart even as he turned inward and found her. He always knew where she was. She's on the basement stairs, he replied, even as he started for the basement himself because, good goddess, Ty had just come that way. And if he hadn't seen her... Lion broke into a run, nearly tearing the basement door off his hinges in his need to find his mate. Ice formed at the edges of his thoughts. Sweat broke out on the back of his neck. There was a logical explanation. There had to be. But his warrior's instinct said otherwise. He followed his finder's sense straight to the closed cellar door in front of which sat Kara's bright green flip-flops. No. Goddess, no. He picked up the shoes, his breath leaving his body as if he'd been slammed in the gut with a battering ram. No! He roared and tore open the cellar doors, racing up into the sunshine, Kara's flip-flops clenched in his hands. Kara! He couldn't see her. He couldn't sense her except in the flip-flops now held within his claws. He began to run, listening, searching, his heart battering the walls of his chest. Roar! Ty grabbed his arm. Get back in your skin. You've gone feral. The cops could still be watching. Lyon struggled against the raging need to rip apart everything and anything in his path. The ice spreading across his thoughts made it nearly impossible to think. They've taken her, he growled. They've taken my mate. My life! Ty growled low in agreement. The cops were the distraction. Kara. His head pounded. His mind screamed. His heart broke. Kara! He would stop at nothing, nothing, until she was once more safely in his arms. Chapter 3 Today Fox followed Cougar into the huge, formerly decorated dining room of Feral House through the back door, his T-shirt plastered with sweat, his sense of frustration and helplessness mounting by the hour, until he felt as if he were going to leap out of his skin. For twenty-four hours they'd searched every square inch of the surrounding area and found no sign of Kara, and no clue who'd taken her and Lynx. Unless Lynx was the one at fault, which made no sense. 
he'd been cleared of the darkness. But they just didn't know. The trail ended a quarter of a mile from the house where Kara had undoubtedly been shoved into a vehicle. There were no clues beyond that. None. In all likelihood, the mage leader, Inir, had ordered her snatched for his evil ferals, who would need her radiance every bit as much as the nine. Fox strode to the dining room table where it sat in front of the wide bank of windows overlooking the sunlit, wooded backyard. It was laden with pitchers of water and lemonade and heaping platters of food, everything from sandwiches and cookies to thick slabs of ham and roast beef. Meals had become a thing of the past as they searched for Kara. They ate when they could now. Jag and Lion were already there, Jag downing a large glass of water, Lion trying to stab a slice of ham with his fork, but the fork buckled under the clench of his fist and he tossed it aside onto a growing pile of crumpled silverware and tried again. The chief of the ferals was holding on to control barely, and it was costing him. His mouth was bracketed by lines of strain, his jaw tight enough that Fox wasn't sure he'd be able to chew the meat if he ever got it to his mouth. Fox ached for the mail. They all did. Lion barely looked up as they entered, his eyes without a glimmer of hope that they'd found any sign of Kara. If anyone had, they'd all know. Their best hope was Hawk and Falcon, who'd returned from Poland about two hours after the rest of them. They'd taken to the skies and had yet to return. The worst of it was, after twenty-four hours, the nearby searching was useless, and they all knew it. Kara was far from Feral House by now and had been from the moment they'd realized she was missing. The kidnappers had used a vehicle, and the ferals not only had no idea what it looked like, but no clue where it was going. Searches on foot and by air weren't going to help, and they had to do something other than sit on their asses. Rage burned through Fox's blood. Frustration tried to claw its way out of his flesh. Instead, they were forced to await word from their allies, mage and Therian alike, for a list of mage strongholds and any sign of recent activity at any of them. But so far, no one had come up with a single fecking clue. Fox grabbed a glass, filled it with water, and downed it in one chug. The ferals should have been able to sense which direction Kara had gone through their natural ability to follow Radiance. In the old days, it was the only way a newly marked feral ever found his way to Feral House, which moved often, but that sense, too, had been blocked. If not for Lion's mating bond, which remained strong and unbroken, they might fear Kara dead. She still lived, thank the goddess, but she was too far away to strengthen them, and in time, that would become a problem. After a couple of months without proximity to Radiance, the ferals would begin to lose their ability to shift. After two years, they'd all be dead. If only his own useless fecking intuition would jump in and help for once, but his useless fecking gut had been useless fecking silent. Lion tossed yet another twisted fork onto the table. Fox refilled his glass with water, but as he lifted it to his mouth, his hand clenched too tight, shattering the glass, spraying him with water. The frustration boiling inside of him erupted, breaking the surface with his fangs and claws. Growling, he swung toward the others, none of whom were paying him much attention. Goddess, he'd never felt so out of control. Where the feck is she? Without warning, Jag leaped at him, ripping the flesh off his shoulder with his own suddenly sprouted claws, knocking him to the ground. You want to fight, pretty boy? He growled around his fangs as they began beating the crap out of one another. Me too. A moment later, Lion joined the fray. Claws ripped flesh, fangs dripped with blood. Adrenaline roared through Fox's body. The pain drowned out by the excitement. He growled and fought and nearly laughed out loud at the sheer pleasure of releasing the pent-up frustration that had been tearing him apart. He got the same excited gleam in Jag's eyes but not Lion's. The chief of the feral's anguish ran far too deep. Lion swung away first, turning his back on them, his shoulders hunched, his hands fisted, 
his claws slicing up his palms until blood ran in a steady trickle onto the floor. Without another word, he stalked out of the dining room. The rest of them watched him go. Fox suddenly felt like shite. My apologies, he told the other two, his fangs and claws receding. No apologies necessary, Cooker said evenly, picking up a sandwich. New ferals are notorious for losing control like that. I've been waiting for it to happen. I'm usually even-tempered, which is why it hasn't happened sooner. Going feral helps us get the frustration out of our systems. Lion suffering goes too deep, but this was good for him. He needed an outlet. Jag clapped Fox on his now-heeled shoulder. You fight like a natural, pretty boy. Fox acknowledged the compliment with a nod. If only we had someone to fight other than each other. He looked at Cougar. Is there anything the Alinas can do to help? Just the word Alinas had his pulse lifting as thoughts of Melisande rushed through his head. Despite everything that had happened, he'd been unable to forget her for even a moment, however much he'd tried. Unfortunately, no. They can find one another or their mates, but otherwise they can only follow maps and directions like the rest of us. Lyons asked them to help out here. Ariana should be arriving shortly to discuss the plans with him. His mouth tightened. Or with Panther. Lyons second. Would Melisande accompany her queen? At the thought, Fox's pulse quickened. The sound of shouts outside had all three of them slamming down glasses, tossing aside sandwiches and racing for the hallway. They reached the foyer just as Panther wrenched open the front door. You killed my daughter, you whore son! You killed her! The furious voice carried from the front drive. Panther strode outside, Fox and the others hard on his heels. In the wide circular drive in front of Feral House, Ty and Viper, two of the original nine Ferals, stood beside Ty's white Land Rover, arms crossed as they watched a furious man Fox didn't know, pound the shit out of Grizz, another of the seventeen who, like Lynx, had presumably been cleared of the dark magic. As Panther and Fox strode down the brick walk, Ty circled the combatants to meet them. What's going on? Panther demanded, his strong Native American heritage evident in the tone of his skin, the slash of high cheekbones, and the jet black hair. Your guess is as good as mine, Ty replied. Viper and I just picked up Rickard from the airport. Grizz was crossing the driveway heading toward the house when we drove up. Rickard leaped from the rover and attacked him. Fox had heard that several more newly marked ferals, more of the seventeen, had made contact and were making their way to Feral House. Rickard must be one of them. They watched the fight with disbelief, but none bothered to step in. Over seven feet of hard, bad-tempered bear in either form, Grizz didn't need defending especially since a feral who'd come into his animal power as Grizz had, could defeat any non-shifted Therian, marked or unmarked. If Grizz wanted to end the fight, he'd end it, in a heartbeat. Fox suspected he wasn't the only one who'd like to know why the male didn't. He was taking one hell of a beating. That's enough, Panther said quietly. We don't need anyone calling the cops again. There were no houses bumping up against Feral House, and the vehicles blocked the sight of those on the other side of the shallow woods, but sound carried outside. With a fist covered in tattooed eagle feathers, Rickert continued to punch Grizz in the face over and over, the crack of bone making Fox's stomach hurt. Rickert had tats everywhere, covering nearly every inch of his exposed skin. Most appeared to be depictions of animals, including a snake that curled around his neck, battling a stallion. A tusk or horn of some kind curled out from beneath one of his ears, cutting across his cheek, its point coming to rest just beneath his eye. Ty and Jag waded into the fight and hauled the enraged Rickard off the downed man. Panther nodded toward the house. Get him inside. As the two ferals led the newest member of the team away, Panther moved to stand over Grizz, who remained on the ground. 
one hand pressing against his forehead, in a pose that spoke more of a pain of the heart than of the flesh. What in the hell was that all about? None of your fucking business. Grizz rolled over and pushed himself to a seven-foot-plus height, his face still bloody, but already fully healed and strode toward the woods that separated Feral House from the rocky cliffs that overhung the Potomac River. As the rest of them watched him go, Panther let out a frustrated sound. We need a break. Just one fucking break. He turned back to the house, and Fox and the others followed. As they stepped into the foyer, Fox caught the scent of pine. His pulse leaped. A moment later, two women materialized at the base of the stairs. Ariana and Melisande. Fox's heart skipped a beat, a sensual energy dancing over his skin as he struggled not to stare at the woman who'd been haunting his every thought for the past two days. She was dressed the same as before, in leggings and a tunic, though today's tunic was more copper in color than true brown and set off her slender curves and flawless complexion to perfection. Her mouth was flat, as if Feral House was the last place she wanted to be, her chin stubborn and hard. But her eyes found him as if she felt his presence as keenly as he felt hers. Their gazes caught. Her ripe lips parted on a shallow breath, color blooming in ivory cheeks, even as those sapphire eyes filled with dismay and frustration. She tore her gaze away, leaving him breathless, his heart hammering in his chest. As tempted as he was to stop, to just stand near her, he forced himself to keep going, to continue across the foyer to the hallway leading to the dining room. Melisanda and Ariana were here for Lion, not for him. He nodded as he passed the two beauties, then headed back toward the dining room and his lunch. He needed food. And a cold beer, maybe several. But as he reached the hallway, he glanced back, unable to resist one last glimpse, and found Melisande staring after him with a hard mouth and eyes filled with confusion and desire. It was all he could do to keep going when his feet wanted to turn back and close the distance between them. Now wasn't the time to pursue the woman. He knew that, not with Kara missing, not with half of the new ferals turning against them. But goddess what she did to him. Sooner or later, she was going to be his. Melisande tore her gaze away from the now empty threshold, shaking her head, stifling a groan, hating that she kept reacting to that male. Her pulse was pounding, her body flushed and damp, and all from merely looking at him. But heaven help her, even with his shirt ripped in blood everywhere, he was a sight to behold with those piercing blue eyes and that fine, fine chest. At least this time he hadn't tried to flirt with her, though for a moment his eyes had flared with heat, and she knew he was as affected by her as she was by him. Damn it. She tried to force her attention back to the foyer and to Panther as he spoke to Ariana, beside her but she found herself shifting restlessly from one foot to the other, too aware of the feel of her soft tunic where it touched her skin, skimming now taut nipples, caressing her arms and back and shoulders. What would it feel like to have Fox's hands on her instead? The question popped unbidden into her mind, and she shoved it away with a scowl. By the mist. I want Alina eyes on Feral House at all times. Panther was saying, If anyone comes near, anyone other than those who live here, I want to know about it immediately. Ariana nodded. Tell me how many warriors you need, Panther, and they'll be at your disposal. Half a dozen, preferably in mist form so they won't be seen by passing humans. Is that possible? Ariana nodded. Yes, if they're careful. Good. The front door opened. Sunshine pouring into the foyer as Hawk and Faith strolled in. No, she was Falcon now, the first female feral in centuries. Exhaustion and defeat lined both of their faces. The hopeful tension that had risen in the foyer at their appearance released in despair. 
Any news? Hawk asked, closing the door behind him. None. Panther's voice was hard as stone. Melisande didn't envy the mage who'd taken the feral's radiant. They wouldn't survive the feral's retribution, and if there was one thing she understood very, very well, it was the need for vengeance. Caston was still out there somewhere. The shifter who'd betrayed her all those years ago, leading her and seven of her Alina sisters into a trap that would see her friends dead and her damaged beyond repair. He still lived. She could feel it in her bones, and some day their paths would cross again. And on that day, she would cut out his heart. A trip of sensual energy danced over Melisanda's flesh, making her gasp, pulling her gaze to the threshold where Fox had disappeared a short time ago. He stood there again, some twenty feet away, one shoulder propped against the door frame, a bottle of beer dangling from his fingers. That sky-blue gaze caught hers, snaring her in a velvet grip, accelerating her heart rate. The barest of smiles lifted his mouth, the smile that stirred the traitorous attraction. A softness entered his eyes, wrapping around her, stroking over her flesh like a warm, gentle touch, igniting a longing she didn't understand and didn't want. She wrenched her gaze away, once more breathless and unsettled, perspiring in a room gone suddenly too warm. Damn him! We'll be going, Ariana said beside her, then shared a brief, tender kiss with Cougar, her mate. Melisanda ignored the mated pair, struggling to get her traitorous pulse under control even as she fought to keep from looking at the man who'd sent it to flight in the first place. Stars in heaven, it had been so long since she'd felt anything like this, since she'd felt virtually anything at all, and she didn't want to be feeling now. She liked who she was, what she was, warrior capable of doing what must be done to protect her queen and her race. Some called her cold, even heartless, but she was fine with that, better than fine. It was exactly what she wanted. Feelings made a warrior soft, made her lose her edge, and that was something Melisande refused to allow. Fox watched Melisande disappear, misting out of the crowded feral house foyer, leaving him feeling solar-plexed. Every time he came anywhere near her, he felt a buzz of desire unlike anything he'd ever experienced. A shadow of the pleasure she'd blasted him with the first time, perhaps, but incredible all the same. He'd been attracted to her from the moment he first saw her. She was so small, so perfect. And he had to admit that hard-ass attitude of hers turned him on, probably because no other woman had ever shoved such blatant stop signs in his face. She was a challenge, without a doubt. But she was more than that. Each time their gazes met, he felt as if he were being sucked into a whirlpool. And he wondered if perhaps she felt the same, if some of her anger wasn't simply a determination to resist. And just how long would she be able to resist? The question tantalized. Where are the new ferals? Hawk asked, hooking his arm around Falcon's shoulders, pulling her close against his side a look on his face that had all of them straightening, tensing. Leopard is down in the gym with some of the others, Panther replied. Grizz took off on foot into the woods a while ago. He glanced at Ty. Rickard? Viper took him back to the dining room to settle him down. Hawk nodded. We need to talk. Lion's office. Panther turned and started down the hall. Hawk, Falcon, Cougar, and Ty close behind. When Jag stepped forward, Fox hesitated. Technically, he was one of the new ones, if not one of the seventeen. Jag glanced at him. Come on, Foxy Locks. Fox flipped him off, grinned, and followed. It was odd, and sometimes awkward to be straddling the two camps. He might be a new feral, but the animal spirit who'd marked him had been one of the nine never lost never infected. 
As they started back to Lyon's office, a shiver stole through him from out of nowhere. An odd shiver, more of the mind than the body. A moment later, two words formed in his head. West Virginia. Had his gut offered up a truth at last? Though what kind of truth West Virginia presented, he had no idea. Usually goosebumps preceded his intuitions, but he knew the nature of gifts tended to change after one was marked by the animal. So was his gut telling him to go to West Virginia? Was that where the mage had taken Kara? The thought teased him, lifting his pulse with excitement, then dropping it just as fast. His intuition more often than not offered up relatively useless information. For all he knew, his gut was trying to tell him that West Virginia was the current location of his next car. Hell, he didn't even know where in West Virginia. Lion, standing by the window, rigid as stone, turned when they entered. Hawk has information. At the flare of hope in Lion's eyes, Hawk held up his hand. Not about Kara, Roar. I'm sorry. The chief of the ferals nodded, his body turning once more to marble. When all eight were pressed into Lion's office, Panther closed the door and turned to Hawk expectantly. The Hawk shifter lifted one steepled brow. We've been acting under the assumption that the new ferals were marked by accident, that the dark magic hampered the animal spirit's abilities to mark the best of the line, leaving the ones marked a random selection. We were wrong. Grunts and groans peppered the small room. The dark magic, Hawk continued, was designed to force the spirits to choose the morally weakest, the most evil, of each animal line. The falcon spirit fought hard against that dictate and managed to choose the one she wanted. Others probably did too, but we already know Maxim was pure evil, so some of the animal spirits failed. Bottom line, there were no accidental markings. The new ferals are each either the best or worst of their respective animal lines. How do we know which is which? Lion demanded. Hawk shook his head. We don't know. He glanced at Jag. As we've seen, you can't always judge a man's soul by his actions. Jag gave a rueful shrug. From what Fox had been able to piece together, Jag had been the resident bad boy, driving his feral brothers to murderous intent on a regular basis, until he met Olivia. Then we have no choice. Cougar's voice was cool as ice. We collect all seventeen in the prisons. Hawk's hold on his mate tightened. Cougar's gaze slid to the female feral, a cutie with dark, blue-tipped hair and a killer smile. Sixteen. Not Falcon. Though Falcon was one of the newly marked seventeen, she was soon to be Hawk's mate, and there was no doubt in any of their minds that she was the one meant to be marked. Cougar turned to the others, meeting each man's gaze, one after the other, ending with his chiefs. Then we start over. Start over. Kill them. Falcon wrenched free of Hawk's protective hold. Grizz fought the darkness to help you. You voted to trust him. Jack grunted. That was before Rickard accused him of murder. Three heads jerked toward Jag, then Panther, as he explained the altercation in front of the house a short time ago, and how Grizz hadn't lifted a hand against his attacker. Hawk frowned. What makes a man take a beating like that without defending himself? Guilt, Jag, Fox, and Cougar said simultaneously. Hawk nodded. The evil don't feel guilt, not like that. Only those with a fully functioning conscience— We've seen his anger management issues. It's probably no surprise that he's caused trouble before, but we've seen evidence of honor in the mail. Are you willing to stake her life on it? Cougar's gaze flicked to Falcon. And ours. Because if we make one mistake, if we allow one evil feral to remain within our ranks, we're compromised. Inir will find a way to use him to destroy us, and if we go down, the demons rise. 
and the world as we know it will be over. Everything we've fought for will be lost. Lion lifted his hand, drawing all attention back to him. We can't start over until all seventeen are accounted for. Jag snorted. As soon as word gets out that the new pharaohs are all dead men, none will come near this place, good or bad. Then word can't get out. Not for the first time Fox thanked the goddess that he wasn't one of the seventeen. The return of the lost animal spirits should have been a godsend. Instead, thanks to the mage, it was turning into a nightmare. Fox opened his mouth to tell him about his gut instinct, but Lion began to lay out a plan, and Fox remained silent. What good was West Virginia? The last thing they needed right now was a wild goose chase courtesy of the newbie. If only his gut would offer him something useful. Where's Lion? Grizz demanded as he strode into the foyer, eyeing one of the feral's brides. Tall and attractive with a gun strapped at her waist, her name began with a D. Delaney. His office, I think, she said. I heard voices in there a minute ago. With a brief nod, Grizz headed toward the closed office door. After the run-in with Rickard, he'd started toward the Rocky Falls, then forced himself to return to Feral House. The situation was fucking impossible now. He'd lay it all out for Lion, let the feral chief decide how he wanted to handle it. It was too fucking bad that there was no unmarking a feral warrior once he was marked because he'd do it in a pig's breath. He wasn't a team player and never had been. He didn't want this fucking job. As he reached for the knob to Lion's closed office door, voices carried to him, low but audible. His hand froze. Rickert will be easy to take down. He hasn't come into his animal. Grizz is going to be the problem. How in the hell are we supposed to get a monster grizzly into the prison without losing limbs? He's not about to go willingly. What the fuck? Grizz pulled his hand away from the knob, his head beginning to pound. He was not hearing this. He won't go easily, that's for damn sure. Leopard might. He allowed himself to be captured once, he might again. A grunt. Not if he figures out he won't come out of the prisons alive. Grizz's blood ran cold. He might. They're all the best or the worst of their lines. If we can just figure out how to identify those who were meant to be marked, we won't have to kill them. Not the good ones. The best or... The worst? And what was he... Not the best, definitely not the best, but the worst? Hell's balls. You do realize that it could be months before we can round up or at least account for all seventeen. What choice do we have? We'll have to lure Grizz down there first. He can't be warned. If he shifts, we're grizzly food. When? Tonight. Grizz had heard enough. He turned away from the door and strode down the hall to the foyer, his footfall silent despite his size, his head pounding. The fuckers were going to kill the new ferals. Wipe them all out. And damn it to hell, he'd been afraid of this because it was exactly what he'd do in their position. Kill the infected ones and hope the next lot were the ones meant to be marked. Especially now when they'd figured out that some were the worst of their line and might be true evil. He entered the foyer and headed for the door veering at the last minute toward the hall table and the wooden bowl where he'd seen some of the ferals drop their car keys. He'd get nowhere on foot, not with Hawk and Falcon hunting him from the air. He grabbed a set of keys with a tag marked Ford Escape and was five strides from the front door when a sound caught his ear, and he turned to find Leopard coming out of the basement, his face flushed with sweat, his short, newly white hair plastered to his scalp. Another of the newly marked seventeen leopard had been ensnared in the dark magic and had followed the evil feral Maxim to Poland, where he'd been forced to help in some kind of ritual to aid Satanin and his demon horde's efforts to rise. But he'd fought the darkness, allowing the good ferals to capture him. He wasn't the worst of his line. Grizz would bet money on it. Would he bet his life on it? Yeah, maybe he would. Come with me, he told the snow leopard. Leopard looked at him with confusion. Where are you going? I said, come.
He'd grab Rickert, too, if he thought there was any chance the mail would come with him willingly without trying to kill him. There wasn't. Leopard glanced down at himself. I'm a little... Chris said nothing, just stared at the man, conveying. Hell, he didn't know what he was conveying, but Leopard seemed to hear it anyway. I guess I could use some air. Yeah, air. And survival. Something the Snow Leopard might not get if he stayed. Grizz led the way out the front door, spying the Ford and the wide circular drive amid the impressive collection of other, far more expensive vehicles. Where he was going or what he was going to do, he had no idea. Something. Overheard words were played in his head. If we can just figure out how to identify those who are meant to be marked. That was the key. Even if he knew he wasn't one of them. Maybe, just maybe, something good could come out of his fucked up life. Even if it turned out to be the last thing he did. When the meeting ended, as they left Lyon's office, Fox caught up with Panther. May I have a word? The black-haired male nodded, led him into the empty war room, and closed the door. This is probably as useless as a chocolate teapot, Fox began, but I've always been a bit of an intuitive, and my guts offered me a truth. Panther's eyes sharpened, making Fox feel pressure to give him a gem. If only he had one. West Virginia, he blurted. That's it. Nothing more specific. The male stared at him, his eyes narrowing. The cub, your predecessor, had almost the same intuition. Only with him it was the mountains of western Virginia. He led me straight into mage captivity. Feck. He also led me straight to Viper whom we'd been searching for. The fox line has always been intuitive. Panther nodded. Sly's intuition was sporadic, but when it was on, it was dead right. Another of my predecessors. The one before the cub. Panther eyed Fox shrewdly. Do you think Kara's in West Virginia? I've no idea. Maybe it's a West Virginia license plate we should be looking for, or it might be the home of my next girlfriend He shrugged. It's likely nothing useful at all, but I thought I should let someone know. Panther eyed him shrewdly. And not create chaos. Which would surely happen if Lyon thought there was a chance that he knew where Kara was. I'll have our allies focus their attention on West Virginia. Panther... He didn't want to make too much of this. Lion's second clasped Fox in the shoulder, at least for now. It's something, Fox, when we've had nothing at all. And if it turned out to be the useless fluff it probably was, they wouldn't be any closer to finding Kara. Chapter 4 Three hours later, after an intense workout in the gym beneath the house, Fox strode toward the stairs. Sweat soaking his hair, his T-shirt plastered to his chest. Jag and Ty had been working with him on his shifting, which he still didn't have under control. He could shift into his fox without much trouble or concentration, but the size he ended up was the problem. While many of the cat ferals could downsize their animals, making it possible for them to pass themselves off as house cats, fox tended to shift straight to supersize. A fox the size of a Great Dane wasn't necessarily a bad thing in battle, but it was a bit problematic if he had to shift anywhere near humans. The bottom line was he needed to be able to control the shift, to be able to move in and out of his animal form smoothly, in the size he needed, without thought or effort, especially with them on the verge of war. And right now, he couldn't. Wolf strode in the front door, looking as exhausted as he probably felt. Any news? Wolf was one of the biggest of the ferals, second only to Grizz, his face a mask of scars. Nothing. Fox wasn't about to mention West Virginia. You've been searching? Tracking with my nose, yes. I was hoping to pick up a familiar scent, even just a mage scent, but I found nothing. Lots of humans. 
I couldn't even scent the mage who must have dragged Kara and Lynx into the vehicle. Makes you wonder how much Lynx struggled, doesn't it? Wolf nodded. Makes me wonder if he's the one who took her. Fox frowned. Maybe he was. He told Wolf about Hawk's revelation, that the new ferals were all the best or the worst. So, even if he was cleared of the dark magic, if he had a black soul... Damn it to hell, Wolf muttered. Unfortunately, this doesn't change anything. It doesn't help us find her. The scent of pine wafted through the foyer, and a moment later, two Alinas materialized not six feet away. Fox's wayward pulse lifted, then settled again when he saw that neither was Melisande. The taller of the two caught sight of Wolf and gasped, her eyes widening with something akin to revulsion. Wolf scowled, turned, and started up the stairs. Cressida! the other one hissed. Sorry, Felicia, Cressida grimaced. He startled me. How does he have scars like that? Is he not immortal? He's immortal, Fox assured them though he'd wondered the same about Wolf. He turned on his charmer's smile. And what can I do for you, lovely ladies? He'd seen Felicia in the prisons a couple of mornings ago. Cougar had called her to attempt to clear Grizz of the darkness in the traditional, carnal way. It had failed, though the attempt had steamed up the underground chambers. Felicia had watched Fox hungrily then as she was now. Sex sirens, Cougar called them. Some, not all. As Fox eyed Felicia's sleeveless tunic, which revealed more lush, lovely curves than it hid, he believed it. With her raven hair falling to her waist and her eyes the inhumanly bright blue of most Alinas, she was a beauty, to be sure. But it was another Alina he longed to see, a blonde with sapphire eyes. Felicia met his smile with a sultry one of her own and sidled up to him. I was hoping I'd run into you. She slid her hand up his damp chest, the invitation in her eyes neon bright. Where are you now? He grinned, in his element. And did you come just to see me, lovely one? We've come to relieve the watch, Cressida explained, but we're early. She eyed him as hungrily as Felicia did, moving to his other side. Phil said you were delicious. Are you busy, warrior? Felicia purred, running a finger just inside the waistband of his pants. Perfume burst around him like a garden in full summer glory. The famed Alina mating scent? Intoxicating. And yet... I was just heading up to take a shower. Their laughter enveloped him, sliding over him like soft hands. We'll join you. Every masculine instinct he possessed urged him to agree. They were absolutely lovely and hungry for sex. But for a reason he didn't understand, he was not. Now, if one of them had been Melisande... Panther strolled into the foyer, his gaze slamming into foxes as a smile lit the dark warrior's eyes. That gut of yours is gold. Fox looked at him in surprise. Panther nodded with a gleam of excitement. We've got our first good lead, war room, in fifteen minutes. As Panther continued through the foyer, Fox gave the lovelies each a brief squeeze, then stepped away from them. I'm sorry, ladies. Perhaps later. Without a backward glance, he turned and took the stairs two at a time, his mood buoyant. As he strode down the hallway toward his bedroom, relief flowed through him warmly, pride straightening his spine. He'd given them their first lead in finding Kara, and a good one. Hot damn. He stripped as he crossed his bedroom, then stepped into the shower in the adjoining private bathroom before the water switched from cold to warm not about to be late for that meeting. As he dunked his head under the cool spray, he let the grin loose. Maybe he and his gut could make a difference after all. But as he reached for the soap, his brain exploded, his vision going black. Feck. 
He reached out blindly, his palm slapping against the tile wall to keep himself from going down. And just as suddenly he could see again, except what he was seeing wasn't real. At least it sure as hell wasn't in his shower. It wasn't even clear. More like watching an old photograph come to life. A movie. In sepia tones. A movie he was part of. He was chained standing up. The rock rough against his bare back. The steel manacles cold against his wrists and ankles. Inside he felt a deep, pounding misery. A misery that turned to fury as a man walked into the unfinished stone room. The male was dressed in the blood-red robe of the mage elemental. Good goddess, was this the famed Anir? The man hardly looked the part of one of the most dangerous immortals on the planet, not with his unimpressive stature and round face. Not until Fox looked into his eyes, eyes of pure copper. Eyes that gleamed with cold, soulless malice. The fox shifter, the mage said, his voice as cold as his eyes. We meet at last. I've been hunting you for some time. Did you know that? He smiled a smile of pure evil. Now you're mine. And soon... The sound dissipated moments before the vision faded to black. Fox found himself once more staring at the water running in rivulets down the shower tile. His heart pounded. Holy hell. He'd never experienced anything like that in his life. Never. Then again he'd been warned that new ferals often acquired new abilities. He dunked his head under the now warm water. A premonition. Was that what that was? Had he just intuited his own captivity? Mage captivity? Bloody fucking hell. This was one foresight he had to make damn sure did not come true. Fox strode downstairs, still shaken from his premonition in the shower, to find a tense, tight little gathering in the foyer. It was at least a couple of hours ago, Delaney said. Ty stood beside her, his arm around her shoulders, his jag... Hawk and Cougar listened close. Grizz wanted to know where Lion was, and I told him I'd heard voices in his office. Oh, feck. Jag groaned. If he overheard our plan. Ty glanced at Fox as he joined them and filled him in. Grizz and Leopard are missing, along with a Ford escape. Fox grimaced. We don't need those two on the loose with that kind of knowledge. Do we just let them go? Jag asked. Cougar nodded. For now. He turned to Jag. Rickert is in his room. Escort him downstairs and lock him up. Then meet us in the war room. I'll give you a hand, Ty said. He kissed his maid and started up the stairs after Jag. Cougar's gaze moved between the two remaining warriors. We've got another new pharaoh flying in tonight. Two others are past due. When they arrive take their phones, and escort them downstairs. Not much of a welcome, Hawk muttered. Cougar shook his head. No, it's not. The doorbell rang. Cougar and Fox exchanged a wary look, but Hawk's face lit up. That'll be Zealand. He called to say he and Julianne would be stopping by. Yeah? Fox was pleased. One of the non-shifting Therians, Zealand was a member of the British Therian Guard, of which Fox had been a part for decades. Hawk opened the door and Fox's old friend stepped into the foyer, accompanied by a small, attractive brunette with turquoise eyes almost as bright as in Alina's. Zeeland said hello to Hawk, then spotted Fox. Kieran! The two men greeted one another warmly. Or is it Fox now? It's Fox, though it's hard to change names after three hundred years. Pleasure lit Zeeland's eyes. I always thought you should have been one of the ferals. I'm glad the goddess got it right. I've always thought the same about you, Z, though I have to admit, I'm kind of glad you haven't been marked. You heard about Ewan. Ewan had also fought with them. Zeeland frowned. I hear the mage have their claws in him. 
Has he really gone to the dark side? Fox frowned, nodding. He's under the thrall of the dark magic that infected all of the Seventeen. Ewan was one of the Seventeen who Fox felt utterly certain was the one meant to be marked. But how did you prove something like that? Unfortunately, we have to catch him before we can cure him. I hope you do it soon. Z curved his arm around the woman's shoulders and pulled her close. I'd like you to meet my mate, Julianne. Fox smiled. He'd heard Z had taken a mate, a young beauty from one of the Washington, D.C. area enclaves. Above, Ty and Jag started down the stairs, Rickert between them. Since Rickert was accompanying them calmly, he clearly didn't have any idea why he was being led to the basement. It was just as well. As the trio reached the foyer, Ty clasped Rickert on the shoulder. We'll make introductions later, during the welcome reception, but right now we have work to do downstairs and you're going to help. Of course there wouldn't be a welcome reception, not for Rickard. He wouldn't be coming out of that basement any time soon, if ever. Fox felt bad for him. How rotten to be marked to be one of the elite feral warriors, only to discover it meant imprisonment, maybe even death. Fox turned his attention back to Zealand and his bride. So this is Julianne. He took the woman's hand and lifted it to his lips in a gallant, old-world gesture, enjoying the freedom to charm, knowing he'd never turn her head. Mating bonds were solid. Did Zealand mention me? Julianne's smile was at once surprised, shy, and delighted, charming him in return. Only when he was in his cups and then he droned on and on about the beauteous Julianne, his sunshine, too young, etc., etc. He winked at her. I take it you are no longer too young. I'm not. She cut Z with a smile laced with exasperation. I haven't been for five years. Five years? Fox's gaze went from one to the other. He didn't tell me that. I was an idiot. Zeeland said, pulling Julianne closer. But she's mine now, and I'm never leaving her again. The look that passed between the pair was filled with such a depth of tenderness that Fox almost felt compelled to look away, another fool risking all for love. So, Fox said, breaking the spell, what brings you here? Both Z's and Julianne's expressions changed, rippling with a tension that surprised him. Julianne is here to meet Ariana. Fox cocked his head, suspicion leaping. You have the look of an Alina, he murmured. Julianne blanched. Fox watched her, mortified. I said the wrong thing. Zeeland pulled his mate closer, but he shook his head. No, it's the truth and no longer the secret it once was. Julianne is one quarter Alina. Fox started with surprise. I didn't know they had babies. The legends claimed that the all-female race reproduced through magic, their maidens born fully grown and ready to take their place in Alina society. They don't, usually. It's very, very rare for an Alina to conceive. Rare still for one to give birth. Zeeland's mouth hardened. When Julianne was nine, her parents were killed in cold blood, leaving her an orphan. A few months ago, the same Alina tried to drag us into the Crystal Realm to suffer the same fate. Fox stared at him, his brows drawing down. Why? Because everyone still thought them extinct, and we learned the truth. They killed to keep their secret. Fox tried to imagine one of those petite, Pretty missed warriors taking life in cold blood. The sweet Cressida, the sultry Felicia, the cold-eyed Melisande. A chill of understanding skated over his scalp. It was Melisande. Julianne's mouth compressed. Cougar says that Ariana didn't sanction the killing of my parents. She didn't even know about it until very recently. She's been asking to meet me. She frowned prettily. I need to understand my heritage. 
I need to know who I am. I'm not sure how much time Ariana will have today, Hawk said. We've just received our first good lead on Kara. I'm sure we'll be heading out soon. Then perhaps my arrival is timely, Zeeland said. If the ferals need backup, I'm available. Cougar stepped forward. We could use you, Zeeland. He greeted Z with his usual reserve, then surprised Fox by leaning down to give Julianne a kiss on the cheek. You have nothing to fear, Julianne. Ariana is as nervous about meeting you as you are her. Your introduction to your heritage was a poor one. You could say that, Zeeland said darkly. I'm not leaving her side. Ariana would never harm one of her own. Cougar turned to Julianne. You're one of hers now, whether or not you choose to acknowledge the connection. It's not Ariana I'm worried about, Z muttered. Cougar nodded toward the other hallway. We're meeting in the war room. I'm afraid it's a closed meeting, but you're welcome to await Ariana in the dining room. Pink will be happy to serve you refreshments. Before Zeeland had a chance to reply, half a dozen Alinas materialized in the foyer, Ariana among them, along with Felicia, Cressida, and Melisande. Fox's gaze found her in an instant, energy and desire sliding over his skin like the soft caress of feminine fingers, sending his pulse into overdrive and the blood flowing hotly through his veins. Even with that hard warrior's expression, she was inexpressibly lovely, her features even and pure, her jaw proud, her body lithe and lovely. Her gaze zeroed in on him, that same mix of anger, confusion, and desire swirling in sapphire eyes. But as she jerked her gaze away from his, turning it to the others, she froze. Her eyes narrowed, her hand flying to the hilt of her sword as her body tensed, as if for battle. Fox took a step forward, driven by an inexplicable need to protect her. But Hawk put a hand on his arm holding him back as Cougar placed himself squarely between Melisande and Zeeland. His old friend had shoved Julianne behind him and was drawing his own knife, a low sound of fury rumbling from his throat. Bloody hell. He'd been right about Melisande's being the one responsible for the deaths of Julianne's parents, and Cougar had clearly anticipated the confrontation. Put the knife away, Zeeland, Cougar said calmly. You defend her, Zeeland demanded. Melisande stepped to the side, where she could see Zeeland, no remorse in her expression. Instead, she wore a hard look that said, Bring it on. But as Fox watched her, something happened. Chaos flared in the cold depths of her eyes, and she swayed ever so slightly, her skin turning pale as new snow. With a hard breath, she seemed to gather her wits, her shield slamming down until nothing showed but that cold warrior's facade. It all happened so quickly he wondered if he'd imagined it, but she was still pale. And if he were to touch her, if she were ever to allow that, he knew he'd feel tremors rippling through her slender form. As Ariana stepped close to Melisande's side, Cougar crossed his arms and faced Zeeland fully. Melisande is no danger to you or your mate, Zeeland, unless you attack her, and then, if you survive, you'll answer to me. Zeeland's disappointment in Cougar's position was patently obvious, but he was a soldier first. He sheathed his knife, but his expression made it clear that Melisande had better keep her distance, or he would happily cut out her heart. At Ariana's touch of her arm, Melisande slowly sheathed her own blade and didn't look any happier about doing so than Zeeland had. As Fox watched her, she glanced at him, and in those glorious sapphire eyes, for the breadth of a heartbeat, emotion flared once more. Accusation. Disbelief. Fear. Why? The woman baffled him. It was as if she wanted the world to think her a cold-blooded killer. But the fact that Cougar defended her 
told him it was just a facade. There was more to the story, more to her, much more. Every time he saw her, he became more intrigued. She stirred his most basic instincts to possess, to protect, and he became more and more convinced it would take a concerted effort to break through those walls of hers, but he had all the time in the world. He hoped. Melisande strode down the hallway to the war room beside Ariana. Her chin was high, her back straight, even if she could feel Zeeland's gaze like a dagger in her spine. She was shaking. Stars in heaven. As she'd faced Zeeland's fury, as she'd met the hatred in Julianne's eyes for one horrible moment, emotions she'd thought long dead rushed up, threatening to strangle her. Sorrow. Regret. She'd fought them back, and they'd slunk away as quickly as they'd appeared, but they had not closed the door behind them. Even now, she could feel them swirling inside her like sharks beneath the ice, awakening. And it could not be born. The stirrings of desire for the Greek god were bad enough, but she would not feel remorse for something she had no reason to regret. She refused. For centuries she'd kept her eye on Julianne's mother, the only half alina in existence, hoping she'd never turn to mist and learn of her true nature. But she had. And Melisande had revealed herself to her, warning her never to tell another soul, ever. The survival of the entire Alina race depended upon it. But the woman had ignored her, spilling her secret to a lover, and Melisande had had no choice but to silence them both. Like mother, like daughter, Julianne had done the same, revealing her secret to Zealand. If not for Cougar's interference, they too would have lived out their last few days in the Crystal Realm. She refused to feel guilt for that. Refused. And she wouldn't feel guilt. She wouldn't feel anything if not for Fox, damn him. If only she hadn't tried to blast him. Something had happened when the pleasure she'd inadvertently thrown at him rebounded on her. The part of her that had been locked so firmly away for centuries was beginning to push free again. Her breath caught, a sick knot forming in her stomach as everything she'd worked for, everything she was, threatened to slip through her fingers. She would not let it happen. It was all the fault of that damned golden shifter. Even now, even without looking, she knew exactly where he was. As the small procession strode to the war room, he followed behind Cougar, Wolf at his side. She felt him, his energy like a beacon, calling to her. They filed into the war room, the ferals with wives taking seats at the table beside their mates, the others standing against the walls of the room. Melisande stood at the back of the room with three of her sisters, her arms crossed tight against her chest in an effort to still the faint trembling that wouldn't stop. The room filled quickly, the scent of hard male bodies teasing her nose, reminding her of the carnal longings that had once been a constant part of her life. Now it was only one male who claimed her attention. Her gaze slid to where Fox stood against the adjoining wall beside Wolf and Felicia. An unexpected burst of anger flared inside of her, startling her as much as it dismayed. Jealousy. This was a day for Lowe's, and Felicia didn't deserve it. One of the youngest of her sisters, Felicia had spent most of her life hiding in the crystal realm, forbidden the pleasures of males and sex for fear the truth of their extinction, or lack thereof, would leak to the mage who were trying to destroy them. Melisanda crossed her arms tighter, setting her jaw as she reminded herself that she should encourage Felicia to bed Fox. With the shifter's attention turned elsewhere, perhaps this unholy connection between them would finally break. All would go back to the way it was before, which was all she wanted. All she wanted. Panther began to speak, drawing all eyes toward the front of the room. We have a lead, thanks to Fox and his intuition. 
The Greek god smiled faintly and gave a nod, but his gaze slid to her as if, in this crowded room, she was the only one he saw. Not Felicia fawning beside him, not his brothers or their wives. Her. As their gazes locked, her pulse tripped, heat flushing her cheeks. She tried to pull her gaze away and couldn't. Fox suggested we investigate a link with West Virginia, Panther continued, drawing the gazes front again, including Fox's. With a trembling breath, Melisanda looked toward the windows and tried to rally her defenses. Maybe she really was going to have to give up her role as Arya in a second and put as much distance between her and that shifter as she could manage. Every time she was near him, she felt them. The whispers of the emotions of the others, startling her and chilling her to the bone. Her eyes widened. No, no, no. Frustration, desperation, hope slid around her like swirls of smoke. Not her emotion, theirs. Something she'd not felt in centuries, not since Caston's treachery. Long ago she'd been a different person, gifted with the ability to sense the emotions of others and ease their torment. A seraph, they'd called her, touched by the grace of the goddess herself. She'd been no warrior then, gentle and kind, unable and unwilling to kill. But Caston had changed all that, changed her when he betrayed her, handing her over to his clan to be raped and tortured mercilessly in a bid for a power she'd had no ability to give them. They'd all but destroyed her, taking everything she was, leaving a cold-hearted, vengeance-driven warrior in her place. And now another shifter, Fox, was threatening to shatter that woman, too. Panther's voice filled the room. In following up on our two missing new ferals, I discovered that one of them, Estevan, called home last night. We've traced the cell signal to West Virginia, not far from Elkins. I called my mage contact and learned that it's long been rumored that Inir once had a stronghold in the Allegheny Mountains near Elkins. Twenty minutes ago, one of his men stumbled upon an abandoned pickup with Canadian tags in the mountain, where the stronghold is rumored to have been. We've run the tags. The truck belongs to the second of our missing ferals, and is only five miles from where Estevan made that call. Silence hung over the room as all absorbed the information. Cougar stroked his goatee. If the new ferals are being drawn to that mountain, Inir is there, and probably Kara. Inir will demand she bring the new ferals into their animals. The ferals exchanged angry, worried glances as Panther continued. My mage contact warned me that if this is indeed Inir's stronghold, we'll be up against powerful magic. We've seen strong warding before, the kind that will confuse and confound until the trespasser doesn't know where he is, let alone where the mage stronghold lies. The warding on this mountain may be a hundred times worse, especially if it contains demon magic. There are rumors of people, mage, disappearing, never to be seen again. We have to be prepared for anything. We're getting Kara back, Jack growled. Rough sounds of agreement peppered the room. Melisanda felt the flare of their resolve and her own, theirs to find their radiant, hers to get as far away from Fox and the destruction he would wreak on her life as quickly as possible. Ariana was going to have to choose another second. The thought of losing her position, her place, was like a blow. But the prospect of losing herself was far, far worse. We'll be sending teams out there ASAP, Panther said. Hawk and Falcon, you'll do aerial reconnaissance, and grid the search to try to minimize the warding's confusion. Jag, you'll lead the second team with Fox and Olivia. Lion will lead the third with Cougar and Wolf. Where is the King of the Beasts? Jag asked. Shouldn't he be here? Panther shook his head. He's already out there. The moment I told him what I'd learned, he called for Alina transport and was gone. Wolf grunted. He could walk into a trap. 
I sent four maidens with him, Ariana told them. If there's trouble, they'll get him out of there quickly, whether he wants to leave or not. Panther turned to Ariana. I'd like for two of your missed warriors to remain with each of the ground teams. Of course. Ariana's gaze caught Melisande's. Mel will oversee the troop assignments. Melisande nodded. Oversee the assignments, yes. Accompany the ferals, not a chance. Hawk. At Panther's prompt, Hawk opened the laptop in front of him and began tapping the keys. Felicia disappeared from Fox's side, misting beside Melisande a moment later, bending close to her ear. Put me with Fox's team. Out of the corner of her eye, Melisande caught a glimpse of photographs filling the screen. These are our two missing ferals, Panther told them. I want him, Felicia whispered. Melisande's jaw tightened, but she nodded, glancing at Felicia. All right. The one on the left is Estevan, Panther continued. The other is Kasten. Melisande jerked at the name, one she hadn't heard in centuries. Her gaze swung to the front and she saw the pictures fully. Time stopped as she stared at the dark-haired visage of her betrayer. The air froze in her lungs. Her vision began to waver. Keston. Hatred flared up, a blazing inferno that ripped across the surface of her mind. Her head pounded. Her face turned hot, then cold, as she remembered that night, as if it were hours ago and not centuries. Keston. The only one she'd never found. The only one she'd never made pay for what he'd done to her and her sisters. Are you all right? Felicia asked quietly. Stars in heaven. She forgot to breathe, to corral her reaction. Yes. But echoes of ancient screams tore through her head until she could barely hear herself think. One thought broke through, crystal clear. This was the answer she'd been searching for. The certain means of locking away her emotions and her awakening softer self, once and for all. Secure the vengeance she'd sought for so very long. Kasten must die. And before his first shift, because once he acquired the power of his animal, he'd be almost impossible to kill. She had to find him before the feral team searching for him did, which meant... She was going to have to accompany them. I know Kasten, Fox said. I worked with him briefly, years ago. He's a fine warrior. Melisande's gaze wasn't the only one to snap to the Greek god. Then your team will track him. Panther turned to Cougar. Yours will follow Estevan. If our guess is right, you'll converge on Inir's stronghold. Melisande's head began to throb. The last thing she wanted was to accompany Fox and his team, to be forced to spend long hours in that shifter's company, especially with Felicia trying to maneuver him into her bed or her body. But as badly as she wanted to stay away from Fox, she wanted, needed, her vengeance more. Chapter 5 Melisande deposited Jag in the pine needle strewn ground beneath the trees, took form, and stepped back, watching as the two feral males and Jag's mate, Olivia, dropped to their knees, dizzily, spilling their lunches onto the dirt. Felicia and Marguerite, who transported the others, came to stand beside her. Marguerite, you'll return to the Crystal Realm. I'll be accompanying this group. Both Alinas looked at Melisande with surprise, but neither questioned her. With a quick nod, Marguerite missed it away. Felicia grasped her hand with an excited grin. I'm glad you're coming with us, Mel. This is going to be so much fun. Melisande didn't return the woman's smile and wouldn't have, even if she could. Fun, this trip would not be. Of that, she was certain. There was no telling what dangers the mage would throw in their path. And then, of course, there was Fox. To Felicia, he undoubtedly was the fun. She could hardly blame the other Alina for being excited about a trip through a beautiful forest with an even more beautiful and unattached male, one she longed to seduce. 
Have at him, Melisande thought as she watched the Greek god push himself to his feet. But the thought of Felicia and Fox together clawed at her insides. Even as she scowled at the thought, the male in question turned her way, his gaze locking with hers. Desire curled deep inside her, heating her, annoying the hell out of her. As their gazes met, his expression gave way to one of smug satisfaction, the smile spreading slowly across his finely shaped mouth as if he saw exactly what he did to her, as if he fully believed she was more interested in him than she pretended, when of course he knew nothing, nothing at all. She wasn't interested. She wanted nothing to do with him. If only her traitorous body would concur. If only she could stop feeling. How she wished it were the other team on Keston's trail. She'd happily accompany Lion, Wolf, and Cougar. She and Lion had come to something of a truce in the past weeks, each agreeing not to try to kill the other. He hadn't appreciated that she'd led an attack on Feral House, though she'd been utterly justified. Cougar had kidnapped Ariana, and Melisande had had every reason to fear for her queen's safety among the shapeshifters. Ultimately, Cougar and Ariana had reclaimed the love they'd once shared, and now the two races worked together closely. Too closely. Fuck! Jag pushed himself to his feet beside Fox. Next time I'm taking the Hummer. Every time I travel by Alina, I swear I'll never do it again. We just saved you hours of travel time, Melisande snapped. Jag glared at her. What are you doing here? Like most of the ferals, Jag didn't like her. Unlike most, he had no bridle for his tongue. Jag! Olivia punched her maid in the arm and turned to the two Alinas. We are grateful for your help. Just don't stab us in the back, Jag muttered, then turned away dismissing them as he looked around. There. He pointed down the hill to a dirt road some hundred yards below. Is that cast and struck? He grabbed Olivia's hand and started forward. Fox winked at her. Winked! Then smiled at Felicia as if she were the darling of his heart before he turned and followed Jag. Oh, she was going to rue her decision to join his team. That was already blindingly clear. Swallowing another huff, she started after them, Felicia at her side. The sun was shining, the late spring day warm but lacking the summer humidity that would arrive soon enough. She breathed in deeply, savoring the smells of the forest. No plants grew in the crystal realm, no trees, no flowers. She'd missed them bitterly during the long years they'd been forced to fake their extinction. Minutes later, the small group fanned out around the late model blue Chevy pickup with Canadian license plates, plates they'd already confirmed were registered to Keston. She tried to imagine the male she'd known in those prehistoric times driving a pickup truck and failed utterly. She'd never lost her heart to him, thank the heavens, but she'd liked him. A lot and never imagined he was capable of such savage betrayal. Jag threw Fox an expectant look. Time to shift, Foxy. Let's see if we can pick up a scent. After you, Boyle. The two shifters moved a little deeper into the trees, and Jag began to strip off his clothes. They must be hiding from prying human eyes, though she'd seen nobody out here, because none of the ferals possessed an ounce of shyness about their bodies. Shifters never had. And no Alina was ever offended by a bit of male nudity, far from it. A quick glance at Felicia told her she was waiting avidly for Fox to begin to strip as well. But when he made no move to do so, Melisande suspected he was one of the ferals who retained his clothes and weapons through the shift. Jag disappeared in a spray of colored lights, and moments later, a full-sized jaguar stood in his place. His head nearly black, his rosettes becoming more and more pronounced the farther they moved down his body. Foxy? The jaguar shifter prompted, telegraphing his thoughts to all of them. As she watched, Fox closed his eyes, began to sparkle, then disappeared. In his place stood a huge fox, 
the size of a Great Dane, with glorious red fur, black legs and a face that was far too engaging. Might want to downsize it a bit, Foxy Locks. Don't want to scare the humans if we run across any. Even as Jag spoke, he shrank himself to the size of a jaguar-shaped house cat. Fuck, give me a minute. I still haven't gotten the hang of this. Melisande found herself biting back a smile, which was a novel experience. Slowly, the fox began to shrink. That's it, Jag coaxed. A little more. It's harder than it looks. It took me several years to get the hang of it. You're a natural. There, he said when the fox looked just about right. That's enough. But Fox apparently wasn't any more adept at turning off the sizing than turning it on, because he just kept shrinking. Bloody hell, I'm the size of a squirrel? Jag's laughter rang in her head. Hey, itty bitty, you get any smaller and you're going to have to ride on my back. The fox sneezed or snorted, but a moment later he was growing again. There, Jag said, and this time the fox stopped. Perfect. You look like a run-of-the-mill red fox. Together the two animals trotted out of the thicker trees and back to the waiting women. His mouth open, the fox appeared to be grinning as his gaze met hers, intelligent laughter lighting those eyes. Yes, entirely too engaging. Jag paced in circles, close to the truck, then looked at the fox. Got a scent? Fuck no. The animal closed his mouth and began to sniff at the ground. Wait, I smell something. Therian. You've got him, then. Let's go. As the four-footed pair loped into the woods, Olivia followed them, Melisanda and Felicia bringing up the rear. Melisanda had seen the feral shift often enough, particularly in recent weeks, but she'd never watched a new feral and she'd found Fox's struggle with his newfound powers surprisingly winning, which she'd never admit to him in a thousand years. He'd turned neither angry nor embarrassed, and he appeared not to care at all that Jag continually called him by some ridiculous nickname or another. Clearly, the Greek god didn't take himself too seriously. If he weren't a shifter, or a male, she might actually find that she liked him. The shifters moved swiftly, but the women had no trouble keeping up even at a walk. They'd traveled more than a mile when she began to hear the shifters' conversation in her head. They must be broadcasting it to all of them. We'd make better time with longer legs, Boyle. There's no sign of humans. Can you upsize without turning into a horse this time? Fox laughed, his animal making that snorting, sneezing sound again. Probably not. A moment later, instead of growing, he shifted back into human form in a spray of colored lights. Fuck! Sensual energy slid over Melisande's skin as it always did whenever she first came near the male in human form. As if he felt it too, his gaze swung back to her, heat leaping into his eyes, a heat that spiraled deep down inside of her. She scowled at him, which only earned her a knowing smile. Looking away from her, he winked at Felicia. Did he think he had to spread his attention evenly? He could give it all to Felicia, all of it, and she'd be happy if he did. Marguerite appeared at her side suddenly. Hawk and Falcon are having trouble. Jag shifted back to human form without warning. What kind of trouble? The alien eyed his naked form with appreciation. Trouble flying... Every time they lift off, they get dizzy and have to land again or risk crashing to the ground. It's apparently the mage warding around this mountain. Jag grunted. Which means we're in the right place, boys and girls. What about Lion, Wolf, and Cougar? Are they having any trouble on foot? Not yet, no. But they wanted you to know that Hawk and Falcon won't be joining you, and there's no cell surface up here. We are your only means of communication. Jag slugged Fox lightly in the arm. Let's get going, Goldilocks. Kara needs us. In the blink of an eye, Jag was once more a jaguar. Fox eyed the other feral with obvious envy, shifted into his too large fox, and stayed that way. I'm glad you decided to join us, pet. 
Fox's voice caressed her mind as he took off after Jag. I'm not your pet. He chuckled in her mind. I... Are you anyone's pet? No, go away. That chuckle again. You intrigue me, little Alina. So much spit and fire in such a pretty little package. Quit calling me little. I'm tall for an Alina. Ah! This time the laughter was in his voice. That explains you're not even reaching my shoulder. It's not my fault you're a hulking brute. The fox looked back at her, mouth closed, eyes intense. Inside her head his voice turned soft, surprisingly serious. I'll concede the hulking. Therian males tend to grow large, but I'm not a brute, pet. Never a brute. Except to my enemies. She wasn't sure what to say to that. She'd held shifters in such contempt for so very long, unable to see them except through the lens of cruelty visited on her by Caston and his clan all those centuries ago. They weren't all like that, she knew that, especially not the ferals, but that didn't mean she would ever fully trust them. Come walk beside me, Melisande. The flirtatious quality was back in his tone. Why would I want to do that? she snapped. Because then you could touch me, stroke my fur. I've never had a female's hands in my fur before. I'm curious to know how it feels. Ask Felicia. She'll put her hands on you any way you like, and we both know it. He didn't reply right away, and she hoped he'd finally given up talking to her. She studied the landscape, reveling in the beauty of the Allegheny Mountains, the wildflowers dotting the ground beneath the spruce and hardwoods. The leaves were still the light green of spring against a bright blue sky. Below, running parallel to the road, a creek glittered crystal clear between a border of large, dramatic rock formations. The place was stunning. So how long have you been in Elena, pet? She rolled her eyes. The mail was relentless. All my life? I'd appreciate it if you'd disconnect me from your inane, rambling thoughts, Feral. If I'm inane and rambling, it's because your beauty is stealing all deeper thought from my head, Melisande. She snorted. Do women really fall for that drivel? Truth be told, women usually appreciate my attention. You're something of a rarity. A challenge, you mean? I. But more than that. There is something between us, you can't deny it. Something happened when you blasted me with that pleasure. Or perhaps your blasting me with pleasure instead of pain was simply a factor of whatever was meant to happen all along. Melisande growled low with frustration. I don't want you, Feral. I don't know how to make that any clearer. I don't want your voice in my head. I don't want you smiling at me. I don't want anything to do with you. Nothing. And that isn't ever going to change. For a moment he was silent. Then the fox paused and swung his head back, watching her once more with those probing, serious eyes. Is your antipathy toward me specifically, Melisande, or toward all ferals? Does it matter? Perhaps not. Though it would be a salve to my battered ego if you said it was all shifters, and not just me. There isn't enough salve in the world to cover your massive ego, she replied tartly. Now you seek to wound me. But the laughter was back in his voice. You're still in my head. I? I'm thinking it may be the only way I'll ever get inside you. You've got that right. Now go away. You'll push me into Felicia's arms, he warned. Good, she wants you. I don't. Very well, he sighed dramatically. You wound me, pet. My heart may never heal. Once again the fox paused to look back at her, laughing. Then his mouth snapped closed and he eyed her with an intensity that told her he hadn't given up. Not at all. And she groaned. 
He wouldn't succeed, certainly not in any way he was hoping to, but he scared her all the same, because he stirred things inside her that had lain dormant for so long she'd thought them gone forever. Things that could, if she wasn't careful, destroy her. Want to tell me what's going on? Leopard asked after they'd left the Washington, D.C. suburbs far behind. Grizz's hands tightened on the steering wheel of an old Toyota sedan he'd appropriated in Leesburg. He'd never been particularly strong at mind control, but the attempt had worked well enough. The Toyota owner now believed he was the owner of a Ford Escape. The Ferrells wouldn't be able to track them via the vehicle, not right away at any rate. I overheard them talking, he told his companion. Surprised Leopard had been content to wait this long before demanding an explanation for their sudden flight from Feral House. All the newly marked Ferals are either the best of our lines or the worst. There were no accidents. Since the originals have no way of knowing for certain which is which, they've decided to imprison us all. Once they have all seventeen of us accounted for, they'll kill us and start over. Silence. Hell, our replacements should, theoretically, be free of the dark infection. They should all be the best of the line. So we're just running away. Grizz admired the threat of disgust he heard in Leopard's voice. You have a better idea? The Snow Leopard shifter ran a hand through short, snow-white hair. There's got to be a way to figure this out. I agree. Leopard turned to him, his eyes sharpening. You have a plan. We're not just running. We're not just running, no, but I'm not sure it's much of a plan. Leopard sank back against his seat. At least it's something. Of course, the fact that we've run is going to be damning in the feral's eyes. We can't be of any help in their prison. So where are we going? Amarillo. Texas? I need to talk to someone. If anyone knows of a way out of this, it's him. You couldn't use a phone? Grizz didn't answer. There was no use trying to explain his relationship with the Indian he needed to talk to. After a few minutes, Leopard said, You trust me. At least you must not think that I'm the worst of my line. Why? Just a hunch. I saw your eyes when you were under the thrall of the darkness. You were fighting it. You let the ferals capture you. I did? You did the same, Leopard frowned. But I heard that Rickard accused you of murder. He did. Rickard. He wondered idly which animal had marked the mail and if they'd ever know. What's that about? Leopard persisted. The old ache pulsed painfully. I killed his daughter. And his grandson. Silence. Leopard's eyes narrowed on him. You say that so matter-of-factly, but your hands are about to snap that steering wheel into fragments. You didn't mean to. Mean to? He'd sell his soul if he thought it would bring them back. No. The boy was mine. But they're just as dead. Fox followed Jag, keeping his animal ears open for sound of trouble or mage, and his nose down for the scent of the one they tracked. But his man's mind remained firmly on Melisande. He longed to strip that neat little mist warrior uniform off her and unbraid that tight plate of pale hair. In his mind's eye he could see her lying in the grass, graceful limbs in casual abandon, her hair fanned out around her like a silken curtain as he licked her from head to toe. He longed to touch her, to kiss her, to make wild love to her. But beyond that, with most females there was no beyond that. They wanted him for his beauty and his body, and he wanted them for the same. Period. End of story. But with Melisande he wanted more. She tugged at him in all kinds of ways he didn't understand. He wanted to talk to her, to know her, to understand her, to make her smile. 
and he felt this need to protect her because there was something wrong. He sensed a vulnerability in her that he hadn't seen the first time he met her, something wounded. It was an odd thought to have about a female so hard and sharp that her every word, every glare, cut. But he'd seen confusion in her eyes and glimmers of fear, and he didn't like it. Not at all. He wanted to understand, especially if he was somehow at fault, and then he wanted to make it right. She fascinated and confused him, infuriated and excited him, almost in the same breath. He wanted to kiss her until she smiled at him with damp, swollen lips and watched him with eyes drunk with passion. And then he'd send her on her way, because he'd be damned if he wanted more. On four feet, he followed Jag onto an outcropping of rocks overhanging a wide, if shallow, creek a half dozen feet below. Jag padded across the rocks, then turned to continue up, away from the creek, Olivia walking at his side. Fox hesitated, looking down at the creek, wondering where the desire came from that had him wanting to leap down into the water. It wasn't a gut thing. He felt no goosebumps or shivers, for that matter, just a tug. Odd. Perhaps it had something to do with his fox. Did foxes like the water? He wouldn't have thought it so, but maybe his did. With a mental shrug, he followed Jag. It was strange and amazing being both man and animal like this, and for the hundredth time he marveled at his changed existence. He marveled at the thought that at one time all Therians had been shifters. How awful it must have been to lose that ability after the sacrifice all those millennia ago. For him, this was still brand new. The other pharaohs had told him that it would take some time for the man and animal to get used to one another and to learn to work together. They'd warned him about a lot of things and informed him that he'd probably develop one or two abilities that he hadn't had before. Lion was said to be able to steal the emotions of another, particularly a human. Tai was good at clearing the mind of a human who'd seen things he shouldn't have. And they'd hinted that Jag could do something with his hands— something the females enjoyed. He wasn't about to ask for an explanation of that one. Apparently sometimes these gifts were new, sometimes just a deepening of talents the ferals already possessed. So far, the only thing he'd seen new was that premonition. And it was bothering him. A lot. How you doing, Foxy Locks? Why don't you walk on two feet for a while? Take a break. I'm fine, Jagabel, but thanks for the concern. Yeah, well, I wasn't really asking, Foxman. Maintaining the shift can be taxing for a new feral, and the last thing we need is for you to do a face plant from exhaustion just as we cross a traveling party of mage. That would be a poor strategy, wouldn't it? Jag chuckled in his head. Yes, it would. Besides, Gaston's trail is clear and easy to follow. There's no need for us both to stay in animal form. We'll take turns from here on out. Since you put it that way... The change flowed over Fox in a heady torrent in a rush of relief. He hadn't realized how much effort he'd been putting into holding the shift until he stopped. But the moment he was a man again, Melisande's sensual energy rushed over his flesh, heating his blood. He longed to walk straight to her, take her in his arms and kiss her until she melted. And he might have considered it if he didn't suspect he'd get a knife in the gut for his efforts. He might do it even then if he didn't sense that odd note of vulnerability in her. Despite the tartness of her words and the coolness of her gaze, he felt the need to treat her carefully. Something told him that she was not a woman to be seduced. But instead... Slowly and carefully, gentled. Which was an extraordinary thought given her indisputable strength. But his instincts with females were usually dead on. Olivia patted his shoulder. Are you okay? He smiled at his old friend, throwing his arm around her shoulders and hauling her close for a quick hug. 
Jagabel suggested I take a break and two-foot it for a bit. She snorted. You two amuse me. But there was a sadness in her eyes that tugged at him. What's the matter, Olivia? Her red hair gleamed in the sunlight, but her eyes suddenly turned bright with unshed tears. Kara, I'm so worried about her. We all are. He squeezed her shoulder. You've become close friends, haven't you? He'd known Olivia for more than a century and knew her well. More than friends. The feral wives. She shook her head. We've become sisters. That sounds silly, I know, but it's true. I love her, Fox. They can't have her. We'll get her back. And they would. The need burned inside of him as it did all the ferals. He glanced over his shoulder at the two Alinas walking close behind, unable to ignore Melisande even if he wanted to. She glared at him, but the glare didn't quite reach her eyes. Was it possible she was beginning to soften toward him? Olivia caught the glance back. Determined to tame that tornado, are you? I'm not sure tame is the right word. To be truthful of, I'm not sure what I'm doing. I just can't seem to look away for long. Smitten, Olivia whispered. Never, he whispered back. With a smile and a shake of her head, she pulled away. Catching up with Jag, she slid her hand along her mate's spotted tail, running her fingers through his fur. Fox watched, filled once more with a desire to know the feel of Melisanda's fingers in his own fur. He paused long enough for the two Alinas to catch up with him, then fell into step beside them. And how are you ladies holding up? he asked, even as his gaze scanned the surrounding vistas, searching for signs of mage, or Kastin, or Kara. His warrior's instincts were so well honed he didn't even have to consciously pay attention. He was always aware of what was going on around him, always. Regardless of whether or not there was a female in his company, he badly wanted to bed. Felicia slipped her arm in his, her long black hair brushing his hip. You've no idea how wonderful it is to be able to walk the earth freely again. We were trapped in the crystal realm, hiding for so long that I thought we'd never be free. You've a lot to make up for. She cut him a seductive look. I do indeed. Her mouth tilted attractively. You know, if we were to take a little break, I could mist you right back to your companions the moment we were through. Felicia, Mel warned. Did she really think he'd abandon Jag? A tempting offer, pretty one. Felicia beamed at him. But my duty is here. Kara comes first. She smiled, the heat never leaving her eyes. I'm here whenever you have time, warrior. Speaking of Kara, Melisanda said coolly, go check on the other team, Felicia. I want to know if they've found anything. Felicia rolled her eyes and a moment later disappeared. Fox eyed Melisanda wryly. Jealous, pet? She huffed. Hardly. She's distracting you, and Kara doesn't deserve that. They needn't worry. He'd miss nothing. But he leaned toward her, his voice a whisper. You distract me far more. You distract me just by breathing. With fascination, he watched her cheeks pinken. No, she wasn't immune to him, not at all, no matter how much she tried to pretend otherwise. Then I'll go. He grabbed her arm. Don't. At the feel of her soft skin beneath his fingertips, attraction spiked, slamming him with need. Melisanda gasped, her eyes leaping with heat and dismay, and dashed through with wisps of fear. Fox snatched his hand back. I'm sorry. She glared at him, her eyes once more cool, her jaw hard. But to his relief, she didn't stalk or mist away. Her expression turned to one of long suffering. I can't leave even if I wanted to, not with Felicia gone. Wisely, he didn't comment, pleased that she deigned to walk beside him. 
It was the first time they'd walked together, the first time he'd gotten close to her for more than a moment or two. It surprised him how natural it felt. The scent of wild heather wrapped around him, her scent, enveloping him in a sensuous fog of want that had his hands clenching at his sides from the desire to touch her again. Deep inside, his fox snarled as if he disagreed, as if he didn't like her so close, as if he didn't like her at all. Contrary animal. She was so small compared to him, stirring his protective instincts, even as he laughed silently, knowing what her reaction would be if he told her so. Pound for pound, she just might be the fiercest person he knew. But God, as she was all female, her stride confident and graceful, her features beautifully delicate. He loved the curve of her jaw and the slender beauty of her throat, the skin satin smooth. How he would love to press his mouth against the hollow at its base, to taste the warmth of her flesh and feel her beating heart beneath his lips. Unfortunately, not only her body language, but that sense he had that he needed to be careful with her, precluded any overt action on his part, even though he was certain that she felt the sensuous energy that leaped between them as strongly as he did. There's a truck down there, Jack exclaimed suddenly. Fuck! It's Caston's. They all joined him to stare down the steep hill. That's impossible, Olivia said incredulously. We're right back where we started. Anger clawed at Fox's insides, his equanimity blowing apart in the non-existent wind. No fecking way. He turned, scanning the forested foothills all around them. Until that moment, nothing had looked familiar, and now everything did. It was plain as day that this was the very spot where they first arrived in West Virginia. He shook his head. How could we have circled back without realizing it? My sense of direction is excellent, and we should have been traveling straight. It didn't make any sense. Jag shifted back to human form in a spray of colored lights and whirled toward them. I smelled him. I know I did. I was on his fucking trail. He must have circled the lake. He turned on Melisande, an accusatory glint in his eyes. Did you know we were circling back? Melisande shook her head, looking around with as much disbelief as the rest of them, the frown on her face for once having nothing to do with anger and everything to do with confusion. No, this shouldn't have happened. Damned mage warding. Jag's gaze met Fox's. Did I screw this up? No, but... Fox hesitated. Jag's gaze narrowed. But what, pretty boy? If you've got an idea, spit it out. Fox wasn't even sure why he'd said but. He didn't have any ideas. He didn't have anything at all, except... Back at the creek... I wanted to leap down into it, and I have no idea why. Jag studied him. Your intuition? Fox started to shake his head, then hesitated. I didn't think so, but maybe it was. Or maybe my fox just felt like a dip in the water. Jag let out a noisy sigh. Yeah. He looked at his wife. What do you think, Red? Olivia frowned. Clearly the warding is screwing with us. I say we follow Fox. Olivia crossed her arms, her gaze worried and frustrated. We have to find a way through this. We'll find Kara, Fox assured her. Though how, when they couldn't even find their way across the mountain, was anyone's guess. You take the lead this time, Foxy, Jack grunted. Let's hope you have better luck than I did. Fox nodded, his heart rate jumping. It was up to him now. He sure as hell hoped he didn't get them completely lost. Or captured by the mage. Chapter 6 Wolf stared in disbelief at the now all-too-familiar rock formation. A pair of rocks sitting at an angle he'd thought interesting the first time he saw it. This was now the third. 
Damn it. At the roar rumbling out of a lion's throat, he knew his chief had seen it too. The sound, more animal than man, raised the hair on the back of Wolf's neck. It was a roar filled with a pain and fury no man should suffer, especially one as fine as the chief of the ferals. This mountain was messing with them big time. They'd picked up Estevan's scent without too much trouble, but it just kept circling back to this rock even when they felt certain they were traveling in a different direction. Twice now. Lion went feral, his eyes turning to cat eyes, his fangs and claws sprouting. He turned on Ariana even as Cougar stepped between them. Find the way, Lion growled. Ariana met that dangerous, furious visage without an ounce of fear. Instead, she shook her dark head with mounting frustration. I can't, Lion. I can't sense the way through this mountain's magic any better than you can. You know I'd take you to her if I could. You know that. Lion dipped his head and swung away, his body radiating barely contained rage as he lifted a small boulder and threw it as hard as he could taking down two pines with a pair of echoing snaps. Wolf ached for his friend. They were all desperate to find Kara. They loved her, every damned one of them. And the bastard mage, probably in near himself, had her. Why can't I sense her? Lion released a roar of such anguish, such rage. Wolf felt gut-punched. If only they knew... Lion was the finder, the one feral among them all capable of tracking down the Radiant, even if he weren't made it to her. If Kara died, goddess forbid, it would be Lion who would have to search out her replacement if she didn't come forward on her own. He physically hurt for his old friend. Lion wouldn't be right again. Nothing would be right again until Kara was once more safely back at Feral House. Wolf felt an echoing ache at his own empty arms, and was ashamed to admit it wasn't for his dead mate, Beatrice, but for another. For Natalie, a woman who'd never been his and never would be. A woman he didn't even want to be his, not really. She was human, and he... he wasn't fit to be any woman's mate. The Alina Brielle fell in to step beside him, surprising him. Few women ever came to him freely, most too put off by the riot of scars that crisscrossed his face. Who is she? Brielle asked quietly, soft understanding in her eyes. Who is who? he growled, nonplussed when she didn't mist away in fright. Brielle didn't so much as blink. The woman who lives in your eyes? It was tempting to tell her that she was mistaken, or that it was none of her business. Instead, he found himself answering, She's human, marrying another. Why? Why what? Why is she marrying another when you're in love with her? He scowled, wishing he hadn't said anything at all. I'm not in love with her. It was ridiculous to think he was in love. He just wondered how Natalie fared. He was worried about her. Besides, I wiped her mind. She doesn't remember me. She... Can't. For her own safety. I'm sorry, Wolf. It doesn't matter. But the words felt like glass in his throat. Do you know where she lives? I... He wanted to deny it and couldn't. He'd been to her house once, in wolf form, on the pretext of keeping an eye on her for her brother, Xavier, who was now a guest and prisoner of Feral House, since they'd been unable to steal his memories of the horrors they'd both seen. I know where she lives. I can take you there, Brielle said softly. Any time you like. He met the Alina's vivid gaze, but though he searched for subterfuge or agenda, all he saw was soft understanding. Thank you, but no. Hell, the longing to see Natalie again was an ache inside of him that never went away, but no good could come of it for either of them, even if she never saw him as anything other than a friendly wolf. No, after that last visit, he'd promised himself he wouldn't go near her again, and he'd meant it. Deep inside, his wolf howled, a pained, 
mournful sound, and his heart ached. Nearly an hour and a half later, they still hadn't found the creek again. Nothing looked familiar and hadn't for most of the trip, yet the two shifters insisted they were following Caston's scent. Melisande ground her teeth in frustration. It wasn't that she didn't believe them, it was just that she didn't trust this mountain. Not at all. None of them did. Over the last hour and a half, Fox had quit trying to flirt with either her or Felicia, his mood deteriorating just as hers was if in a different way. He walked ahead now, at Olivia's side. Melisande's gaze caught on his back, lingering over the snug, perfect fit of his army green tee, which so beautifully defined the shape of him, his broad shoulders, trim waist, and the thick, muscular arms. As much as she told herself to ignore him, her Alina's eye for fine male flesh had reawakened, and there was no turning a blind eye to so magnificent a specimen. By the mist, in another time, another world, this shifter would certainly have become her lover and might have become her mate. The energy that continually leaped between them told her that. And Alina rarely found such connection with a male, but when she did, it was rarer still for her to be able to walk away from it. The Alina ended up forming a mating bond with the male a bond that destroyed her when her mate died, as males often did. As she watched, that fine back bowed, Fox's biceps flexing, his hands fisting until he looked like he was ready to let out a massive roar, which would not be a good idea in enemy territory, and the male surely knew it. Jag, Olivia called quietly. The jaguar shifted back to man, turning to Fox. You okay, Fox Man? The mountain is messing with us and I fecking had it. His voice remained low but so tight with fury that Melisande could barely believe the words were uttered by the same man who'd charmed her so relentlessly a short while ago. That fury slid over her, wisps of smoke. Deep inside her the need to ease that fury stirred. She tamped it down, shoving back the gift she hadn't used since the softer parts of her died all those years ago. She wanted nothing to do with her softer self. As she and Felicia moved far to the side, Melisande caught sight of Fox in profile. His teeth clenched, his eyes taking on an animalistic light. He was shifting, no, going feral, that in-between place where the shifters could fight as equals, regardless of the animal spirits who'd claimed them. Fangs sprouted from his mouth and claws from his hands. Jag watched, a smile slowly spreading across his face. Feel like another fight, foxy boy? I'm more than happy to give you one. Without further warning, Jag leaped at Fox, drawing his own fangs and claws, tearing a chunk out of Fox's shoulder. The two powerful males threw one another to the ground, ripping at faces, arms, chests, as if they fully intended to kill one another. Melisande watched them with a mix of disgust. They were animals. And fascination. She'd seen shifters fight like this in the old days. But to watch a male as calm as she'd believed Fox to be turn so... feral... was surprisingly exciting... It's a wonder he's been able to hold it together as much as he has, Olivia said, joining her. Kieran, Fox, is more even-tempered than most males, an incredibly controlled fighter, but he's still a new feral. The fight didn't last long. Minutes later, they were pulling apart, grinning like a pair of idiots as their claws and fangs retracted. Jag wiped the blood from his chin. Feel better? I feel brilliant. Fox turned to her, his face still wreathed in a grin, battle-lust lingering in his eyes. Give me a kiss. Not even in your dreams, she retorted. To no one's surprise, Felicia took him up on his offer, running to him lightly, pulling his head down and kissing him soundly. Even with his mouth pressed to Felicia's, Fox's gaze remained locked on Melisande and his eyelids dropped closed and his arms went around the other woman, pulling her close. Jealousy flared bright green behind Melisande's eyes, 
but she bit down in the need to rip her sister from the troublesome male's arms. They were welcome to one another. Melisande had no use for men, and every one of her sisters knew it. Fox released Felicia, slamming Melisande with both his gaze and a grin that crowed victory, as if he could see the jealousy smoking inside of her. Damn feral. Her fingers curled and she barely resisted the need to press her fist to her stomach, to ease the ache of all the emotions clawing at her insides, fighting to get out. With dismay she sought the anger, the rage that had been her constant companion for so long, and found it distressingly absent. What was happening to her? She could never again be the woman she was before her capture— that woman had died in too many ways to count. But who was she if not the warrior who hated shifters? I smell water, Jag said nearly two hours later. Why it had taken so much longer this trip around, Fox had no idea. Well, that wasn't true, was it? He knew exactly why. It was the fecking mountain and its fecking magic. Goddess only knew what kind of danger Kara was in, yet they'd made no progress toward finding her, none whatsoever. Still, if Jag smelled water, hope stirred. Maybe that's our creek. Give that intuition of yours some leeway, Goldilocks. Will do, Boyo. Minutes later, they came upon a creek similar to the one they'd seen before, or perhaps the same creek, just a different spot along it. Fox stepped beside the stream and reached out, desperate to feel his gut stir or tug or wave its hands in the air and sing the Irish national anthem at the top of its lungs, anything. And he got nothing. Let's follow it a ways, Jag suggested. And not ten minutes later they found that rocky overhang he'd been searching for. This is the place and damn if he didn't feel that same urge he had before to leap down into the creek. We're crossing. He shifted back into human form and got body-slammed by Melisande's sensuous heat flowing over his skin, sinking into his pores, into his blood, blasting him with the need to feel her against him, under him, tight around him as he thrust deep inside her wet heat. Damn it, to hell and it was no wonder his frustration kept building out of control. He looked back to find her watching him with a heat that mirrored his own. A lost look raced across Sapphire Eyes a moment before her shield slammed down. Everything inside him urged him to go to her, to help her, to comfort her. But those now frosty eyes and the rigidness of her shoulders told him she wanted nothing more than for him to leave her alone. There would be time aplenty in the months to come for him to solve the mystery of Melisande. Once Kara was safe. Is that your gut talking? the jaguar asked, looking up at him. I believe so, he hedged because at the moment all he was hearing was his body's screaming demand to touch the lovely Elena. He shivered. And suddenly he knew. Finally. I'm completely sure. This is the way. Shifting back into his fox, he leaped off the rock and into the water, splashing through the creek on fox paws and climbing out the other side. Giving himself a shake, he shifted back into a man and got hit with the same bloody blast of sultry energy. If only he could find a way to shut it off, or satisfy the need it created. Out of the corner of his eye, he watched Melisande and Felicia disappear, and then reappear just as suddenly on the other side of the creek. Olivia pulled off her boots and waded across barefoot while Jag leaped across in his animal, then began rooting around for Caston's scent. With an effort, Fox yanked his mind off the woman who tormented him and shifted back into his animal. His gut might be telling him to go this way, but why? Was this the direction Caston went? Would this path lead them to the mage stronghold in Kara? Was it the direction of the juicy chipmunk as Fox was hungry for? Got it. Nice work, Goldilocks. Caston's trail, Fox asked hopefully. Yep. Plain as day. How in the hell it's going this way and circling back is anyone's guess. 
Maybe Caston did the circuitous route the first time, too, thanks to the warding, then headed across the creek. Fox could only hope that was the reason for the strange trail, though it didn't explain why it had taken them nearly twice as long to reach the creek the second time as the first. He was afraid the warding really was screwing with them, which meant they could still conceivably wander this mountain for days and make no progress whatsoever. They traveled through sundown and into the evening. For a time they continued by moonlight, but when the clouds began to slide in, shutting out all light, Jag called a halt to their progress. Olivia can't see, and neither can I unless I'm in my animal. We'll rest. Get some sleep unless the clouds and moon cooperate a little better. They'd seen no Drayden, which was good news. The small, gaseous demon remnants fed off Therian energy and would attack them in their human forms. Fortunately, they didn't bother the animals or Alina's, and Olivia was Drayden-kissed one of only a handful of Therians who could turn the tables on them, draining the Drayden before they could harm her. Jag pulled a small lantern out of one of the packs, built a small berm around it with underbrush and dead leaves, then turned it on low, offering enough light for them to see one another, but not so much that it would be seen from a distance if there really were a mage around. Olivia pulled sandwiches out of one of the packs and handed them out. Felicia and Melisanda settled on a rock nearby, but Melisanda was the only one who accepted the food. You don't eat? Olivia asked Felicia. I can, and I do sometimes. There are other ways Alina's prefer to feed. She glanced at Melisanda. Most Alina's. Pleasure, Olivia said matter-of-factly. Yes? Felicia threw Fox a look of speculation and no small invitation but it was Melisanda who captured his attention and wouldn't let go. He took the sandwich Olivia handed him and bit into it as he tried to keep from staring at the blonde. Legend called them sex sirens, and he'd come to learn that for many of them that was true. They fed on pleasure of all kinds, music, dance, art, especially the pleasures of the flesh. And they were reputedly skilled and inventive lovers. If only it were Melisande who wanted to feast on him, they'd be away from here in a heartbeat, and he'd have that trim little tunic and leggings off her so fast it would make her dizzy with delight. Melisande rose, finished with her sandwich, and turned to Jag. We'll take watch while you sleep. Jag nodded. Felicia joined Melisande, and the pair walked away from the campfire. When they were a distance away, Jag glanced at Fox with speculation. What is it with you and the Alinas, pretty boy? The nice one looks like she wants to devour you, and the bitch looks like she wants to lop off her friend's head for it. Don't call her a bitch. Fox's words were sharper than he intended. No, they weren't. Jag watched him with interest. Okay. Olivia nudged her mate with her shoulder as she swallowed a bite of sandwich. If you tell him you're jealous of all the Alina attention, I'm going to have to beat your ass, Feral. Her words held a hint of laughter and the utter confidence of a woman well-loved. Jag grinned, cupped the back of her head, and gave her one hell of a kiss. If there is an ounce of jealousy, and I'm not sure there is, it's a pride thing. Nothing more. Not a one of them holds a candle to you, Red. Not a woman on this planet, or its clouds for that matter. Though it was clear they were teasing each other, Jag's expression turned intense. Not a one. Olivia kissed him back, far more tenderly, then pulled back, laughter in her eyes. Don't you forget it? Those two sharp feminine eyes swung to Fox. So, what's going on with you and Melisande? Fox shrugged. Unfortunately, nothing. Jag snorted. You just about went feral a moment ago when I disrespected her. Trust me, that's not nothing. What does your animal think of her? He asked with studied indifference. He snarls when she's close. Jag cocked his head, his gaze turning thoughtful. It's just lust then, Foxman. I admit we didn't think it was. 
Cougar says when an Alina can't hurt a man, that male is probably destined to be her mate. We've been taking bets on this thing between you and Miss Bitch, uh, Miss Melisande. Sounds like I have some inside information now because the animal spirit is usually the first one to recognize the feral's mate, usually long before the feral himself. And if the fox spirit is snarling, that female is not destined to be your mate. Fox glanced at the lantern. That was good news. Of course it was. Great news. He was drawn to her. More than drawn. He was utterly and totally obsessed. But the last thing he wanted was a mate. He wouldn't take her as his mate even if she really was the one. And she wasn't.